All right, we're going to get started. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Ver to the Vermont Reimagining Drug Policy Conference. I'm Gray Gardner, a senior policy counsel for the Drug Policy Alliance, which, as many of you know, is the nation's leading organization working to end the drug war and replace it with policies grounded in health, equity, and human rights. We're excited to be hosting today's convening in partnership with the Decriminalized Vermont Coalition, and we've brought together some incredible experts to discuss drug policy that's based on evidence, professional insights, and personal lived experience. Today's event is being recorded and we'll be taking some questions for the panelists who will be appearing later in the program. Please submit any of your questions for the speakers in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try our best to get to as many as possible. The agenda for today's event is available on the Decriminalize Vermont website at decrimvermont.org, where you can also find information about drug policy news, resources, other events, and much more. You can also subscribe on the website to get future updates. We'll also be including links to additional resources in the chat. And if you post about today's event on social media, we hope you'll consider adding uh, the tags that we'll include there as well. Now it's my pleasure to welcome and hand the mic to one of the foremost experts on drug policy and drug policy reform in the US and internationally, who's been a leader in the movement and the drug war punishments for many years and who serves as the executive director of the Drug Policy Alliance. She'll introduce our speakers and offer some, some opening thoughts. So I hope you'll join me in welcoming in this virtual space, Cassandra Frederic. Hi, uh, thank you so much, Greg. Welcome everyone, and thank you so much for spending some time with us today for the event. I realize that many of you are carving out time from your regular schedules, maybe listening while you're juggling other responsibilities, maybe catching just one segment. The fact that you're here is really wonderful. Um, we really appreciate you. Um, and we really appreciate and are grateful for Vermont. Um, many of you have, may have been working on the issues at the heart of this event in the legislature, in public agencies as advocates. And many of you are doing the incredibly hard work of providing services to people who need support. Um, many of you might not work in the fields directly related to these issues, but you're here because you want better solutions. Uh, regardless of what brings you, we're so happy that you're here. Drug Policy Alliance is here because we, because there's a lot of work to be done. Um, as we all know, there are these are extremely challenging times. Um, we live in an increasingly stressful world, a world with growing housing insecurity and inaccessibility, widening income gaps, and an economy and society that's too often not inclusive, polarized, and sadly lacking a lot of empathy. A world where we continue to withhold investment in the things we know contribute to health and well-being a world where we continue to lose so many people we love, our family members, friends, our neighbors, to overdose, infectious diseases, and to systems that have fermented and emboldened dangerous and tragic policing tactics. My heart aches and continues to ache for those that are not with us. And I know that many of you share that pain. The drug laws that we've normalized in the past 50 years centered around the threat of punishment that many of us have grown up with and accepted without question. And those laws have failed us. Over 100,000 people are dying every year in this country. And last year, another record year were lost in Vermont. And they were lost under our existing drug laws. Right now, the laws that we have in place, the draconian controlling ones, we still lost a record number of Vermont people. We're enforcing harder and harder after five decades, and that still has led to an overdose crisis that is setting records every year. And as we as a country have spent decades enacting laws that make it increasingly harder for people who use drugs, particularly those who have come from certain communities to live and be full participants in society, We've shut doors and erected barriers to housing, employment, education, professional licensing, and nearly everything that connects us to society and to each other. 
We've literally invested a trillion dollars into punitive systems, into fear-based public education, and into low-quality coercive treatment. And it has been resoundingly more harmful than helpful. But there are things that give me a lot of hope. There are researchers who have spent much of their careers studying the impacts of these drug laws. Researchers like Jennifer Carroll, Belina Beatty, and Corey Davis, who are going to join us later today. Advocates like the wildly respected Neve Eastwood, who have spent dec decades tracking the progress of drug law enforcement around the world and leading reform efforts in the UK and Morgan Godwin, and former Vancouver Mayor Kennedy Stewart, advocates, public officials, and scholars like these working to make the world a more compassionate, supportive, and safer place for everyone, regardless of their relationship to drugs. And folks like our keynote speaker, Dr. Sarah Wakeman, who have made it their life's work to provide high quality addiction treatment while researching, educating, and inspiring others to offer dignity, respect, and high quality services to their clients. Because that's what this field should be about. Building systems of care, support, healing, respect, and love. Systems that keep people alive and offer a hand when people are ready to take it. Systems that center dignity, autonomy, and equity as fundamental to our efforts to build healthier people and communities. What gives me hope is that places in this country and this world where people care about these values and care about making good evidence-based policy. Vermont is, in my view, is one of those places. And that's why we're here today. Time, time and time again, we've seen Vermonters ask the hard questions, propose thoughtful solutions, and come together in ways that at least strive to make things better. We saw that last year with an overwhelming support of the Reproductive Liberty Amendment, which enshrined personal liberty and autonomy, reproductive autonomy into your constitution. We've seen that over the years as DPA has worked with our partners in the state to institute smarter drug policies. Years ago, you all built a system that set out to expand access to treatment. You all pass bills to make naloxone and clean syringes more available, including over the counter. You pass one of the better Good Samaritan laws in the country. You took the bold but common sense approach to step of decriminalizing buprenorphine. And just last year, we all worked together to ensure that people can get help testing their drugs at community based organizations and find out what's actually in the drugs that they're already possessing and intending to take so that we could prioritize saving lives above all else, especially above criminalizing people. We have been there with you and will continue to be with you all to build a better, healthier, equitable, compassionate, and yes, more cost-effective system of care. And then there comes a time when those that are in the position to lead have to decide. Are we going to keep wishing and praying that the methods that we've used our entire lives will miraculous, miraculously start achieving different outcomes? Or will we look at the evidence, listen to those firsthand experience, and implement policies that we know are better, policies that we know are more humane, policies that are rooted in dignity, autonomy, and respect for each other? Today, we worked to bring you a few of the experts, folks who can talk about the impacts of our drug laws and what places are doing differently. These days, there's plenty of rhetoric about drug laws and people who use drugs, but too often not enough sharing of real data, real expertise, and real lived experience. That's what today's event is all about. And that's what DPA is about. We're building a future without the drug war, a future where people are a part of our community, regardless of their relationship to drugs, a future where people who use drugs are supported and not punished, a future where bodily autonomy is protected and respected, and a future where drug policy is grounded in evidence, health, equity, and human rights. None of the things I've just said are radical. As you'll see, shifting to a fully health and human rights-based approach is a, rational, is a rational and responsible thing to do. While I wish I was, I, while I wish we were all in person um, for this event this year, um, in part because I actually do like Vermont and I have enjoyed the square quite a bit. Um, hopefully, today's events offer an opportunity to bring more Vermonters across the state to be here. 
And fortunately, it's allowed us to bring together some great speakers from all over the globe. But next time, I hope we get to do this in person. Um, before I introduce our keynote speaker, I want to thank everyone who's helped make this event possible. Our speakers, Professor Jessica Brown, Jennifer Carroll, Valina Beatty, Morgan Godfin, Corey Davis, Neve Eastwood, and Kennedy Stewart. I also want to thank the DPA team for working really hard on this, um, including um, our fearless Vermontian leader, Gray Gardner. Um, thank you so much. Um, and our partners in the Decriminalized Vermont Coalition. Many of you have worked for years to improve drug policy in Vermont and bring about some of the drug policy reforms I talked about earlier, and who are doing the incredible work, the incredibly hard and undervalued work of providing harm reduction services, peer recovery services, social work, civil rights, legal representation, and so much more. We can't thank you enough for all the work that you're doing, and we're excited to see what this coalition and this movement is growing in Vermont. This is a really important point because this work is really hard to do with your neighbors, especially when you live in a small town, especially when you live in a small state. Being out front on these issues that it goes against um, public rhetoric, um, what, what we know to believe because of what we're taught, um, having the courage to do this work um, where you're not anonymous um, and you have to stand on your values um, and continue to push forward is to be commended and is deeply appreciated. And it shows people in other places that are not big, like a California, like a New York, that they can do it in their place too. So Vermont doing this, Vermont having these conversations and pushing forward is important for other places in the country to continue to do this work. So just want to continue to reemphasize how important it is that y'all are doing this and how much so many people around the country are rooting for you. Now, it's truly my pleasure to introduce someone who's very inspiring, a leading expert in addiction medicine, an incredible scholar and thought leader, and a well-respected practitioner, Dr. Sarah Wakeman. And the crowd goes, wow, woo! Um, Dr. Wakeman is the Medical Director for Substance Use Disorder at Mass General Brigham, the Medical Director for the Mass General Hospital Substance Use Disorder Initiative, the Program Director of the Mass General Addiction Medicine Fellowship, and an Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. Uh, she is a diplomat and a fellow of the American Board of Addiction Medicine and board certified in addiction medicine by the American Board of Preventative Medicine. She has many jobs. Um, and yet still somehow she manages to hold down a half a dozen extremely prestigious roles and still has made time to join us today. And we're so grateful that you've made this time. I know we don't have a live audience today, so the applause is loud, is hard to hear. But I hope you all will welcome and welcome, uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Sarah Wakeman. Thank you again so much for being here, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and Cassandra is one of my sheroes. And so I just feel incredibly honored to even be sharing a stage with her virtually and wish we were all together as well. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. Just make sure everyone can see that. Um, give me a signal if you can't, but I'm going to assume everyone can see my screen. Um, I'm really excited to be talking to you guys today um, and moved by Cassandra's opening and just thrilled to, um, to be a part of what's in a really important day and list of speakers. As we think about sort of the harms of criminalizing people who use substances and punitive approaches to drug policy and to clinical care, um, I really wanted to focus first on sort of the opposite. What actually works? What are the harms of how we've been operating as a society in a country for um, really 100 years? And what does good treatment and harm reduction look like? And so um, for today, I titled my talk, Compassion First, A Primer on Stigma, Treatment, and Harm Reduction. Um, for folks that haven't had the privilege of meeting, I'm an addiction medicine doctor by way of internal medicine. So I also practice primary care and um, work in the hospital taking care of people with heart disease and pneumonia and diabetes. Um, and for me, that's been a really beautiful way to think about substance use disorder care. And I'll talk more about that and an opportunity to really think about this rooted in the same approach for any other health condition um, for the patients that, that I get the privilege of serving. 
think we all know we're in the midst of the worst overdose crisis of our time, of our country, of history. Um, and more than 100,000 people are now losing their lives. And as Cassandra pointed out, that's in the context of trillions of dollars poured into a failed war on drugs. And I really think of this as a crisis due to inadequate care and failed policy, because really no one should die from a drug overdose certainly not from an opioid-involved drug overdose, where we know how to reverse an overdose when it occurs. We know about public health and harm reduction interventions to keep people safe who are using drugs. And for folks who do have opioid use disorder or another type of substance use disorder that is contributing to their risk for dying from overdose, we know how to treat that underlying health condition. And so the fact that more than 100,000 people are dying each year from a preventable cause of death is truly a failure. Um, and I hope today we can talk about really how we got here and what are some opportunities to think differently about approaches. Not only is the overdose crisis worse than it's ever been before, but racial and ethnic disparities have been worsening um, in the past several years. When we look at the most recent year that we have data nationally from the CDC, we saw that in just one year, overdose death rates increased 44% for Black people and 39% for American Indian and Alaska Native people. Here in Massachusetts, where I live, the highest rates of overdose by far are amongst um, individuals who identify as Latin A, individuals who identify as Native, and Black individuals. And this intersects with many other structural barriers like income inequality. So if you look at overdose death rates, there are two times higher for Black people in counties with high in income inequality. When we think about the impact of age, overdose death rates in older Black men are nearly seven times higher than in older white men. I think importantly, we have begun a very beginning conversation reckoning with racism across our society and the health harms of racism and of living in a racist society. And the overdose crisis is one area where we see that dramatically. And that should come as no surprise when we think about policy, because racism has always been a part of drug policy and drug policy rhetoric and decisions in our society. If you go back to one of the seminal um, uh, legislative uh, pieces that was passed that really impacts the type of care we're allowed to deliver when it comes to addiction medicine, I think back to the Harrison Narcotics Act, which was actually a tax law in 1914 um, that paved the way to make it illegal for doctors to prescribe a drug to treat drug addiction. And if you look at what was being published in um, very high impact newspapers like the New York Times, the so-called paper of record in 1914, it was articles like this one that played on anti-Black racism to really stir up fear and support for racist drug policy um, and harmful drug policy, and again, laid the stage for where we find ourselves now. We know that people um, who identify as white or black use drugs at the same rate. You can see below from National Survey on Drug Use and Health sort of rates of drug use. And yet when we look at the criminalization of people who use drugs, there are vast differences. So black, Latin and American Indian individuals are far more likely to be stopped, searched, arrested, convicted, and harshly sentenced for drug law violations. And of course, we then see the system functioning as designed, where the majority of people in federal and state prison for drug offenses are black or Latin A. And the United States um, is exceptional when it comes to our experiment of mass incarceration. So when we think about the way we imprison members of our society, we far outpace any other country in the globe where one in four individuals in the U.S. is under correctional control. And it hasn't always been that way. So I think it's interesting to think about the intersection between the war on drugs and mass incarceration and where we find ourselves now. So if you think back to sort of before the 1970s, our, our sort of rates of people who were in prison and state and federal prison populations were relatively stable. And yet you see this dramatic surge that starts around 1972. And actually looking at this graphic now, I often think that the visual looks quite similar to our overdose death rate rise, although the timeline is slightly different. And it's helpful to sort of track along in this um, framework of thinking about systems functioning as they were designed, that this mass incarceration experiment that's so exceptional in the U.S. really tracks along with our decision to launch a war on drugs in this country. So think about Nixon declaring war on drugs, making drug use public enemy number one, the establishment of the DEA, the Nancy Reagan's Just Say No campaign, Reagan signing the anti-quote-unquote drug abuse act that um, enshrined racial disparities in sentencing for powder versus rock cocaine, the creation of ONDCP and the appointing of the first drug czar. And you can see this sort of growing, swelling um, population of people in prison. And we already talked about the racial and ethnic disparities and who it is that's getting criminalized that's being imprisoned. 
And it's not just our, our sort of um, carceral systems that are identified as such, so our jail and prison and probation and parole systems, but also systems of supposed support that also function as an arm of the drug war and similarly surveil and really harm um, people who are using substances. And one example of that is the child welfare system, or some people call it the family regulation or family policing system. This is a fantastic report um, put up by the Movement for Family Power that um, talked about how the foster system has become ground zero for the U.S. drug war. You can see between 2000 and 2011, one in 17 white children were um, removed from their parents' care, one in nine black children, and one in seven American Indian children. As a mom of three kids, I can think of nothing more painful or gutting or harmful than family separation or being separated, um, having my children ripped away from my arms. And so I think there are many things that touch us in this work, and this is one that um, is incredibly gutting. And watching my patients who have had their children taken away, who've um, and by far and away the number one reason that people get ensnared in the child's welfare system or the family regulation system are um, allegations of parental substance use. And as you see in this quote here from this report, again, it's not a coincidence. So this is about systems functioning the way they were designed, that the overwhelming majority of parents involved in the foster system are living in poverty, identify as Black, American Indian, Latinx, nor is it a coincidence that the foster system has been designed to protect children from one type of harm only, harm from their parents, rather than really thinking about sort of what are the harms of poverty, of intergenerational trauma, of lack of affordable housing, of, again, the drug war. And we see that play out and this smokescreen of sort of blaming parents and blaming um, substance use uh, as a smokescreen behind which this injustice plays out. As we think about sort of, again, the harms of punitive approaches, I think um, the family regulation system is uh, one of those examples, as I mentioned, that's so gutting. Um, and it's also one where we often talk about it as if sort of um, these types of pun punitive models are actually intended to help people or to benefit them. And so I'll often hear people say, well, you know, this would be motivating, sort of being risking losing custody of your child or being involved with um, the Department of Children and Family or Children um, and Youth, depending on what state you're in. It's going to be a motivating factor for this um, parenting person to work on their substance use. And yet that couldn't be farther from the truth. And we see that play out in the data. We also see the racial and ethnic disparities intensely um, in, when we think about child welfare involvement. So again, despite the fact that substance use rates are similar, um, hospitals are far more likely to drug test Black parenting and birthing people and report people to child welfare services who identify as Black than who identify as white. And this layers on to the fact that Black communities are already experiencing intense social surveillance. And so layered onto that is this surveillance and involvement of child welfare in the family regulation system. And then when we think about the harm, both for parents and for children, in terms of that separation, that primal um, wrenching of an attachment bond between parent and child, we see a negative impact on both the child and the parent, where losing official custody actually increases parental drug use by a factor of four. And qualitative work has really um, painted the painful picture of what people experience when they go through this custody loss, a significant psychological toll on the emotions of guilt, bitterness, anger, feelings of failure as a parent, and helplessness. And the harms of sort of a punitive um, criminalizing uh, policy environment, you know, have many different angles in which they cause harm. So one is we think about the criminal legal system, as we think about other systems that sort of extend that carceral model systems of um, like the family regulation system or the child welfare system, but also what the impact is on drug supply and on the risks of overdose and harms to people who are using substances. And so folks have coined this term called the iron law of prohibition and, and individuals who are listening may have heard this, but if they haven't, I just want to talk through it because I think it's really important when we think about the current drug poisoning crisis. Um, this was a concept that came out of alcohol prohibition, where when we look at what happened during alcohol prohibition, before prohibition, um, Americans who used alcohol or consumed alcohol mostly consumed lower alcohol by volume substances. So beer and wine, you know, 5% ABV, 8% ABV, 12% ABV. But once it became illegal to consume and manufacture and sell alcohol, as you increase the cost of illegality, you increase sort of pressure on the system. So there's a need to avoid detection 
Um, and there's also sort of a need to Im improve the likelihood of your return on investment if you're taking the risk of getting arrested or going to prison. Um, and so we see this sort of pressure on the market that leads to a shift to higher concentration, um, less weight and volume, which makes it easier to hide, store, and transport, and easier to make money when we think about sort of the supply side of any substance use market. Um, and so what that meant alcohol prohibition was that people who were using alcohol shifted from using lower alcohol by volume substances where they knew the content of what they were using to using very high potent um, spirits often that were manufactured in ways that obviously weren't regulated. So moonshine and um, and uh, alcohol that was um, sometimes led to poisoning and blindness. There's, you know, stories of, of dozens of people dying or, or, um, or developing very morbid conditions like blindness because of consuming a bad batch of alcohol during the time of prohibition. And so that concept is, ha we've seen that play out with other types of substances. So whether it's cannabis, where again, the shift to higher THC containing cannabis to then synthetic cannabinoids um, from, you know, cocaine from powder cocaine to rock cocaine. And then of course, in the opioid crisis, the shift from heroin to then illicitly manufactured fentanyl um, and much more potent substances. And that has been the driver as we think about the rapid uptick in overdose deaths over the past few years. So if you think about the waves of the overdose crisis, we saw rising rates of opioid-related overdoses begin in the 1990s. And sometimes it feels like we're stuck in the 1990s in terms of sort of policies and interventions that are still focusing on supply-side interventions around prescription opioids. And yet we saw that um, a sort of access to prescription opioids and use of prescription opioids peaked around 2012 and began declining after that. And yet rather than declaring sort of the overdose crisis over, you know, we limited the supply of prescription opioids, we should have seen people's lives saved. But what happens if all you do is focus on the supply, you actually squeeze the balloon, you put pressure on the market, much like on um, that concept of the iron law of prohibition. And if you don't address demand, why is it that people are using substances? Why are we not addressing sort of the adverse childhood experiences, intergenerational trauma, poverty, lack of economic opportunity, racism, and of course, treating opioid use disorder? People don't magically stop using drugs because it's harder to access prescription opioids. What happens is they shift into the illicit market. And so you see this sort of rapid uptick in heroin-involved deaths beginning around 2012. And then illicitly manufactured fentanyl really penetrates the market and begins to dominate. And this blue line shoots off with um, deaths related to synthetic opioids, which is really illicit manufactured fentanyl um, and the current poisoning crisis that we see today. So as we shift from thinking about sort of the harms of racist drug policy of our war on drugs approach, I also want to talk about sort of the core fundamental tropes and stereotypes about people who use drugs. And of course, this is amplified for um, certain people who use certain types of stigmatized drugs, because the reality is that most of us use drugs across society. But um, obviously, there are drugs that are more stigmatized. And when we think about the intersection with racism, um, there are um, communities that have been more impacted by stigma around drug use. This was an interview with Dr. Dole. Um, Dr. Dole was actually an endocrinologist. So he was a, a, you know, a diabetes doctor. If you don't know medicine, endocrinology is the field of diabetes and thyroid disease and um, adrenal insufficiency. And um, if you think about a condition like diabetes, many people need a sort of chemically similar molecule to restore normal functioning and feel well again. Um, and Dr. Dole and his colleague and actually wife, Dr. Niswander, were the two physician scientists who discovered methadone as a treatment for opioid use disorder. And they published their their first paper in 1965 in one of our leading medical journals. And it was really this sort of amazing effect of giving people escalating doses of methadone who had chaotic, severe heroin use disorder at that time, and seeing this incredible um, transformation that as people got to a therapeutic dose, all of a sudden they felt normal again, and they didn't um, need to engage in acquisitive crime. They weren't getting ensnared in the criminal legal system. They were able to focus on other things that they cared about, whether that was relationships or work or, or other goals that they had in their life. Um, and he really came to think of severe opioid use disorders very similar to other types of endocrine conditions that he treated earlier in his career, like diabetes, where some people require um, insulin, for example, to, um, to feel normal and to feel well. Um, and this interview was him sort of reflecting on his career. And, you know, he stumbled into the field of addiction medicine. Again, he didn't train in that area. That wasn't sort of what he set out to focus on. And he talked about that he really had to unlearn the stereotypes that he'd been impacted by, that we all are impacted by as members of society. Um, and and this is the notion that sort of people who use drugs are weak, um, they're hedonistic, they're unreliable, they're depraved, they're dangerous, you know, they lie. All of these myths um, are completely false, and yet they continue to be believed by the majority of the medical profession and the general public and continue to distort public policy. And, you know, this was a 1994 interview, so he was reflecting on the 
preceding 70 years. Unfortunately, I would say in 2023, this is still the case in many instances. And so um, distorts not only public policy, but also what clinical care looks like. But the great news is that we have seen huge advances in the science of addiction and treatment. Um, and it's important to to pause and say, and we'll talk more about this later, that not everyone who uses drugs has addiction. In fact, most people do not. And we'll talk about that um, myth as well. But in the realm of four people who do have addiction, and that's where the area of medicine I've focused my career on, we have seen um, just tremendous advances. We know about effective life-saving interventions, whether it's medication treatment, um, uh, other types of intervention, harm reduction interventions, and we'll talk through some of those. And this is very similar to other public health crises. If you take HIV or COVID, you know, it really is um, science that's been the strongest ally in resolving public health crises and ending the overdose crisis is not going to be any different. We need to look to what works. Um, and I think that's particularly important when we think about health issues where there's a lot of ideology involved. And the great thing about science is that it's true whether you believe in it or not. Um, and so uh, while I won't take you through all of the science about what works, I will touch on that briefly. Um, and I think uh, the, the robustness of the evidence that we have around harm reduction interventions and treatment interventions and voluntary welcoming non-coerced treatment interventions is really um, incredible. And yet, despite that, so again, methadone first study published 1965 in one of the top leading medical journals, fast forward to where we are now. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, much of what is called treatment in the addiction world looks nothing like what we would call treatment for any other health condition. And there's this vast gap between what we've studied and shown to be true that low barrier, welcoming, person-centered, harm reduction oriented treatment, medication first, um, flexible care models that go into the community that welcome people into care. Um, um, really don't happen outside of pockets of innovation. And I think there continues to be this vast implementation gap. And that really is a result of decades of marginalizing addiction as a social problem rather than treating it as a medical condition. Um, and this comes from a report from Casa Columbia and remains true. Um, and again, I often think as a general internist that much of what we call treatment in the addiction world would frankly be malpractice if we practice that way with any other health condition or any other human being impacted by a health condition. And so just to sort of illustrate that. And I, I often use this for colleagues to just sort of um, highlight the disparity in how we approach substance use and substance use disorder versus other health conditions. You know, we talk a lot about systems failures when we think about other health conditions. And if you think about cardiovascular disease, for example, if a patient comes into the hospital with a heart attack, they would never be blamed for their health condition. They would never be sort of given a list of resources and expected to navigate that on their own. They certainly wouldn't be told they couldn't get life-saving medication without first working on some lifestyle or behavioral interventions. And they wouldn't be given discharge paper work that gave them sort of a stern reminder to not do this bad thing, like have a heart attack. And yet when you think about what the experience is for a different health condition, for someone with substance use disorder or substance use related health condition, we routinely see that that sort of blaming, shaming um, the person as a problem, the person as a failure rather than the system, the policy, or thinking about treating the health condition as a problem. Um, and so a person who comes in with, for example, um, drug use associated endocarditis often is told there it's their fault, either explicitly or implicitly, that they have this consequence. Um, if people are lucky in many health systems, they still get sort of a list of resources to try to navigate on their own despite having a life-threatening treatable health condition. Um, many programs still withhold um, life-saving medication unless people follow sort of a certain strict protocol, including um, psychosocial treatment, despite the lack of evidence for that. Um, and I've seen in too many discharge papers from other healthcare systems that I can count for my patients actually written in the text something like, don't use drugs again or you'll die, as if that's sort of a helpful thing to say to a human being. So why does care look so different? Well, the core reason is really stigma. We think about drug use. Um, there's an older study that I think still holds true um, done by the World Health Organization in 14 countries. It found drug use to be the single most stigmatized condition across 14 countries. And we know stigma has deep ramifications. That stigma is associated with worse mental and physical health, out health outcomes for people who use drugs. And stigma is among the top reasons for why people don't access treatment. Um, and we see this time and again, that people have been treated so terribly in systems that are supposed to help them like a hospital, that they would rather, in some cases, you know, die from a treatable condition or um, manage something themselves than come and deal with being treated so poorly when they come in into healthcare systems. 
And I think it's really important to think about stigma and policy because the whole point of criminalize something is to make it a stigmatized condition. And so we're giving a lot of sort of lip service these days to the idea that addiction is a public health issue and that we shouldn't be stigmatized. Um, and that's great. And yet if our policies continue to criminalize people who use substances, it is really hard to undo stigma. Um, and, and again, the point of criminal law, laws is to stigmatize. And of course, because of racism and the pieces we've talked about, and um, we know that drug policy impacts and is impacted on um, communities, uh, certain communities of people and um, certain types of drug use. So what is stigma? I think it's good to pause for a moment on that. You know, stigma is a social process that's linked to power and control. It's this idea of creating an other. So it leads to creating stereotypes and assigning labels to those that are considered to deviate from some societal norm or to behave, quote unquote, badly. Stigma creates the social conditions that make people who use drugs believe they are not deserving of being treated with dignity and respect, and it perpetuates feelings of fear and isolation. When we think about what makes something stigmatized, there are kind of two main factors that influence how we perceive stigma. Um, and, and those are this notion of cause and controllability. So stigma will decrease when someone thinks it's not their fault or they can't help it. Um, so, you know, they didn't cause this thing and they can't control it. And that's where our ideology around drug use and certain types of drug use comes into play with stigma, because we have all been fed this notion um, at the core of everything that people who use certain types of drugs are to blame for their condition, that they could stop if they want. To, that they are bad people doing a bad and immoral thing. And that leads to sort of the stigma that we see enshrined. And of course, that's enshrined in our policy and punitive approaches to substance use. So when you think about stigma and substance use in particular, again, stigma is this persistent, pervasive um, notion that addiction is a personal choice, reflects a lack of willpower and a moral feeling. And includes things like labeling and stereotyping, discriminating against people with substances, people use substances and people with substance use disorder. And discriminatory policies are an example, both an example of stigma and also a way that we maintain and perpetuate stigma. There are different types of stigma when it comes to substance use and substance use disorder that can be internalized stigma. So people blame themselves. They feel hopeless. They've often been told this so much from society, from our laws, from people that, um, you know, that they love and care about, that they are doing something bad, that they've internalized that sense of self-blame. There can be stigma even within the recovery community, which is a community meant to support one another to have that same shared lived experience. For example, the stigma around medication treatment, the medications are not quote unquote real recovery. There's a lot of stigma from clinicians, doctors, nurses, therapists across the gamut. Um, and that can, can really sort of lead to this nihilistic, pessimistic notion, even within systems that are supposed to be caring systems um, and can um, make people think that substance use disorder is not a treatable health condition, um, or even worse, that people who use drugs are not worthy of treatment. And then there's stigma from the outside. The public is influenced by all of this, and this leads to the dominant notion of certain types of drug use being a choice, being bad behavior, being criminal behavior versus a treatable health condition. And of course, that trickles down into our approaches, because if you think someone's doing something bad, you would support punishment. If you think something someone's doing something illegal, you might support more punitive drug policy. So just to give kind of three concrete examples of stigma from the world I live in, which is within healthcare spaces, um, one example is people who are treated with opioid agonist therapy, so methadone or buprenorphine, which are our most effective treatments for opioid use disorder, are um, routinely discriminated against and can't get access to medical rehab. So if you have um, a condition that you need to be hospitalized for, many people will go to a nursing facility or medical rehab after their hospital stay to continue to get stronger, or get physical therapy, or get IV antibiotics. Um, and across the board, skilled nursing facilities um, routinely discriminate against people who use drugs and people who are on medications like methadone or buprenorphine. Buprenorphine. Certain residential addiction treatment facilities are sober living because they're not considered quote unquote abstinent or in quote unquote real recovery. Um, the way that we um, enshrine sort of criminalized approaches to pregnant and birthing people um, in our mandatory reporting laws that vary from state to state. But in many states, people who are treated with life-saving medication or people of a positive toxicology test, despite the fact that there's no concern for abuse or neglect or emotional or physical injury of their child, will be reported to Child Protective Services for abuse or neglect investigations. And then in how sort of the probation and parole system works in this country, where many people are mandated to, quote unquote, abstinence as a condition of probation or parole. So they have a positive toxicology test, despite engaging in treatment um, or following other conditions of probation or parole, they can be re-imprisoned. 
And language is another powerful way in which we enshrine and perpetuate stigma. And this is something that we can all change very easily. So policy change can be hard, although um, with support from DPA and, and others, it, you know, it can be easier. But um, language is something that we can do day in, day out. Um, and there are lots of terms that are stigmatizing when it comes to substance use. And I'll talk a little bit more about that language in the next slide. And this is not just an issue of semantics. It can sound sort of like political correctness to focus on language, but actually language influences how we think. Even highly trained um, professionals are impacted by language. And so there have been really elegant studies where if you take PhD level clinicians or master's level therapists and you describe a patient to them, and the only thing you change is whether you describe the patient as a substance abuser or as a person with a substance use disorder, the clinician is more likely to recommend punishment if the person is described as a substance abuser. If you do the same thing with the public, actually the public, um, their notion and stigma about substance use and about people who use substances increases if you describe a person as a drug addict versus as a person with opioid use disorder. And why does that matter? Well, people with more stigmatizing views of addiction are more likely to support punitive rather than public health policies. So one thing we can all do is change our language to improve care. And, and the important thing here is to use person first and accurate non-stigmatizing language. And so by person first, I mean not to describe someone by their condition. So to never use language like addict or alcoholic, but to say they're a person with an alcohol use disorder or a person with a substance use disorder or a person who uses cocaine because people are more than their substance use and more they're more than their substance use disorder. We would also never refer to someone as the breast cancer. So why should we refer to someone as the alcoholic or an alcoholic? Um, again, you're sort of defining someone by that alone. There are also terms like dirty, clean, abuse, abuser that are really problematic. The term abuse literally comes from a word that means a willful act of misconduct. And there have been these studies showing that people even clinicians are more likely to support more negative approaches if they hear someone described with that sort of language. And then take words like dirty and clean, you know, even clean that people use um, in a positive way to say that someone's in remission from their substance use disorder. What does that imply about someone who's actively using substances? And, you know, I always remember a colleague of mine who unfortunately died from overdose, um, who identified as being a person in recovery. And he was interviewing, interviewing for, um, for jobs in the sort of treatment space. And people would ask him during his interview, you know, how long have you been clean for. Um, and he used to joke that he would tell them, I've been clean since I was born. I've been bathing every day since I was an infant and I've been in recovery for five years. Um, and so I think that sort of reminder that what are we really saying with our language here? The other thing I think when we talk about treatment, there's a lot of stigma and in fact, punitive policy when you think about some of the mandatory reporting laws around medication treatment for opioid use disorder. So medications like methadone or buprenorphine. Um, and we reinforce that with language like medication assisted treatment, which really insinuates that medication is not treatment. We don't talk about, you know, diabetes care as insulin assisted treatment, despite the fact that, of course, there are multiple different holistic interventions that are pro um, important when we think about diabetes care. So to just call it treatment or call it medication for opioid use disorder um, to stop using a different lexicon when we talk about substance use than other health conditions. So what is it, we care about stigma, but what is the impact of stigma? Well, it erodes confidence that substance use disorder is a valid and treatable health condition. It can be a barrier to getting a job, to maintaining your housing, to relationships, to parenting. It deters the public from wanting to pay for treatment, from um, allowing insurers to restrict coverage, and it maintains punitive law and policies. It stops people from coming in and accessing needed services because they have been made to feel unworthy. It creates barriers to people staying engaged in care because the models of care often are punitive in nature and people feel unwelcome or judged by the staff. And it impacts clinical care and treatment decisions. And lastly, it's intertwined with these ongoing myths about drug use and addiction. So I'm going to turn with some of the mythology that I think really um, continues to exist and, again, maintain stigma and is caused by stigma. Um, so the first is this um, over-pathologizing all drug use. So there's this myth that people who use certain stigmatized drugs all must develop addictions. This idea that if you use heroin one time or methamphetamine one time or rock cocaine one time, you will all, everyone who does that must develop addiction. Um, and we do this in the healthcare spaces a lot. We really over pathologize drug use. And we don't talk about the fact that all substance use exists on a spectrum. I think people recognize that for more socially acceptable substances like alcohol or even cannabis, where this idea that some people choose not to use at all, and that's great. Some people use in a way that is actually has benefits in their life or causes 
positive positive effects. Some people might use in a way that has low risk of all involved with it, all the way to sort of using in a way that um, that is associated with more maybe health risks or maybe um, when you think about alcohol, we see people have harms from intoxication even if they don't have an alcohol use disorder, and then all the way up to what we think of as quote unquote addiction or substance use disorder, where people are using in a chaotic way where they've lost control of their use, where they're using despite consequences. And that spectrum matters, I think, again, to not over pathologize all drug use, but also because people can move along that spectrum. So um, someone who's using in a chaotic way can move to using in a lower risk way um, and thinking about sort of where people fall. Um, so if we think about that myth that all people use certain drugs to develop addiction, what's the reality? Well, the reality, again, is use exists along a spectrum and that the vast majority of people who use drugs don't ever develop addiction. And so that also matters a lot when it comes to policy, because often our policy is framed around this notion that everyone has addiction, even some of our um, policies that purport to help people, like mandating people to treatment or mandating people to drug court, are really framed around this idea, um, first, that people who use drugs have no autonomy, that their brain is broken, and that they all need treatment. But the reality is that many people get ensnared in the criminal legal system because of the war on drugs don't actually have addiction or a substance use disorder. If you look at this study, and um, this is looking at the cumulative probability of transitioning from use of a substance to dependence or having a use disorder, and it looks at nicotine, alcohol, cannabis, and cocaine. And so alcohol, you can see, is the black line there. So actually the most quote-unquote addictive substance is nicotine. So if you look at people who start using nicotine, about a third of them will go, or, or more, will go on to um, developing a tobacco use disorder or nicotine use disorder. In contrast, if you look at alcohol there, it's about 15% of people. And then if you look at cannabis, that's the lowest, it's about less than 10% of people. And then cocaine falls right along the track with alcohol. And so I think we just have to be really accurate and those of us who um, function as professionals in this space, whether we're researchers or physicians, have a responsibility to not misrepresent what sort of drug-related science has shown, because that can really contribute to dehumanizing stereotypes, to racial disparities, to harmful policies and practices, and so to really present and discuss the full spectrum of use. Another really common myth that we see then play out in some of these punitive policies or things like coerced treatment is this notion of tough love, this idea that if you just make people's life worse, they're going to sort of pull themselves up by their bootstraps and snap to it and get better. And I think there are so many myths in this. And I love this quote by Maya Solovitz, who's a journalist and a person um, who identifies as being in recovery from substance use. Um, but at its core, addiction is defined by compulsively using drugs or alcohol, despite bad things happening happening to you. So if you recognize that as sort of the sine qua non of addiction, why would making more bad things happen to someone help them get better? Especially when using drugs or using alcohol is actually a very powerful coping mechanism during times of trauma and times of stress. And so we're actually doing the exact opposite of what people need. People get better when they feel loved and connected to and cared for, when they have something to hope for or someone is holding hope with them. They do not get better when they're punished or made to feel small or when their children are taken away from them or they're kicked out of their housing or they lose their job. Um, and I think Maya describes that beautifully in this, that, you know, she, everyone's journey is different, but for her, she was using drugs compulsively because she hated herself and she felt like no one would love her if they really knew her. And so how would humiliating her, how would sort of an intervention style model or a punitive treatment model um, help her with that? And that actually fear of cruel treatment kept her from, from seeking help long after she knew that she needed um, help. And so I think that sort of dominant confrontational approach we've all seen shows like intervention continues to be very um, common and is certainly enshrined in approaches like coerced treatment or um, treatment courts. Yet the reality is that kindness is what helps people get better. This top quote is from um, an email actually that a patient sent one of our um, clinicians on our inpatient addiction consult team. Um, he had been hospitalized with endocarditis and had been there for a long time and um, had gone on to get discharged and to do very well and was um, in remission and working and parenting and reached out many months later. And, and the thing that he wanted to highlight was the fact that um, this provider, as he described it, was a light in his darkest times when he was in the hospital. And he just wanted to thank her for the time she came in to talk and listen while he was there. It meant more than she could ever know. That's an anecdote, a powerful one, and we have many of these, but there's also rigorous evidence around this. So really interesting meta-analysis of therapy outcomes found that clients' report of therapist empathy was actually the best predictor of their eventual treatment outcome. And yet, what does our system do if someone's like, oh, I don't like my therapist, or I don't feel like they're caring? It's like, oh, well, this person's not motivated, they're in denial, they're not ready. Um, there's not a sense of like, wow, well, that really matters. If you feel not cared for, and like you're the person that you're seeing doesn't have empathy for you, you are more likely to have a bad outcome. Um, and yet, 
if that's what the evidence shows. The other myth is this idea that addiction is a poor prognosis illness. The reality is most people get well. Certainly with opioid use disorder, we have life-saving, highly effective medication treatment. There's nothing I treat in medicine that has more effective medication treatment than opioid use disorder, hands down. Um, and yet it really is our policies and our approaches that keep people from being able to access effective care if that's what they need. This was a long-term study looking at um, people with opioid use disorder and the impact of buprenorphine treatment. And they followed um, over 300 people for about three and a half years and found, of course, on entry in the study, 100% of people had to meet criteria for opioid use disorder. And at the end of three and a half years, fewer than 8% of people still met criteria for, at that point, DSM-4 diagnosis of opioid dependence. That's incredibly high. I don't see a 92% remission rate for really any other chronic health condition that I treat. So what is effective treatment? So when we're talking about opioid use disorder, medication is the backbone of that. But really, we think about a menu of options similar to other chronic conditions. So medications, psychosocial interventions that are voluntary, high quality, rooted in empathy, recovery supports, which are not formal treatment, but can be really helpful for some people as they're engaging around care. And then harm reduction, which to me is a part of treatment, not sort of a corollary or something that's in conflict with treatment. And this is how we approach any other health condition. If I think about diabetes, hypertension, depression, HIV, anything else I take care of in general medicine, we really want to identify someone who has a health condition. I want to talk with a human being who's affected by it about the diagnosis, what it means, what treatments are available, what the likelihood of different outcomes are with those treatments. I want to make sure they have immediate access to treatment without any barriers. And then sometimes we need to refer for specialized care or other services. And yet we would never say that we weren't going to treat someone's diabetes because they were dealing with homelessness or because they didn't have a refrigerator for insulin. We would figure out how to address those barriers and work with a human being who's affected. And there continues to be this difference in how we approach substance use versus other health conditions. And that gets at this sort of core ideology. And this is um, one of my favorite papers written by Walter Ling. Um, it's sort of his perspective on the history of medication treatment for opioid use disorder in our country and why the mere existence of life-saving medication like methadone or buprenorphine hasn't been enough to radically change outcomes. And he points to the fact that really the issue is ideology, that we as a society think that people with addiction and people who use certain types of drugs should just knock it off, that they should strenuously haul themselves up by their bootstraps and stay off no matter what. And for nearly a century, physicians also have been indoctrinated by that societal attitude that people with addiction or people who use drugs have brought upon themselves the suffering they deserve. And even though it's now very politically popular to talk about this as a health condition, now that white people are being affected, so that in and of itself is an evidence of racism in our approaches to drug use crises. Our policies don't reflect this idea that people, maybe they're sick, but they also are doing something bad and sinful. And so we really shouldn't help them too much, or we should do so in a way that really takes away their agency and punishes them. So what actually is effective? Well, patient-centered care. That's what we do for everything else, right? So it's a relationship-oriented care that has the whole human being at the center of it, where we respect people's unique needs, their culture, their values, their preferences. We really support patients in managing and organizing their care at whatever level and in whatever direction they choose, but with the information to make the right decisions for themselves based on their own preferences, their needs, their culture, their history. Um, and that's, again, how we think about other types of healthcare. And that is what's been shown to work for substance use disorder too. It's really voluntary welcoming care models. This is an interesting qualitative study um, of people who are treated with methadone or buprenorphine, looking at what factors help people stay connected to care and what factors um, were associated with people falling out of care. And, you know, people fell out of care when they felt not welcome back. So one person said, you know, they came back after 15 days of being out of care, and this is for methadone, and they were told well, you could only miss 14 days um, to stay in treatment, and so you're no longer eligible. Think about that for a minute. We are in the middle of the worst drug overdose crisis of history. We have life-saving treatment. And rather than saying, oh my goodness, thank you for being here today. How can I help you? What made it hard for you to come the past few days? How can we address some of those barriers? We say, nope, sorry, you're no longer, you're no longer welcome here. In contrast, people who were able to stay connected to care talked about that staff who worked with them, who are nice and caring and respectful, who offered them support and encouragement, that those are the most important factors. And one quote from a person said, you know, they showed me that there's light at the end of the tunnel. There's hope. You hear that? There's hope. And so I think that gets to really the philosophy of harm reduction and how that is an important integration into treatment, not something separate from treatment. Um, first, to just acknowledge that harm reduction, there's sort of harm reduction of the capital H&R and harm reduction of the lowercase h&r. Um, first and foremost, harm reduction was created by and for people who use drugs because our society has punished, forgotten about, and marginalized um, and not created systems that are helpful. Um, and it really is focused on improving health and well-being, including during active drug use. 
It is focused on reducing the negative consequences of drug use, irrespective of whether someone wants to make changes to their drug use, provides people a menu of services. It's non-judgmental, non-coercive, focuses on quality of life. It engages people in the plan. It's centered around their goals and it celebrates any positive change. And yet there's this false dichotomy. So this is from the um, UN back in 2007, um, a report on harm reduction, where they said harm reduction is often made an unnecessarily controversial issue, as if there was a contradiction between prevention and treatment on the one hand and reducing the adverse health and social consequences of the drug use on the other. This is a false dichotomy. They are complementary. I think this really gets to the core of what we're talking about. This is about human rights. It's about dignity and compassion. And human rights apply to everyone. So people who use stigmatized drugs have not forfeited their human rights, including their right to the highest attainable standard of health, their right to housing, their right to um, autonomy and bodily autonomy. Um, and I think that core principle um, really is at the root of what we're talking about. So why harm reduction? Why should this be a part of treatment or a, pro a part of approaches to substance use? Well, first, it's congruent with the principles of medical ethics. Um, if there are any doctors in the room, we have taken, you know, our oath that first do no harm. It's similar to how we approach other health conditions. What is chronic care management if it's not harm reduction or public health? What are seatbelts or a life vest or many other things that we do? It also recognizes that the pathway to whatever someone is working on can be circuitous. And for some, recovery might not be the goal. Treatment might not be the goal. And that's okay. So this notion that harm reduction is only valid if people are working towards recovery. Really, um, what does that say? That says that we don't value the lives of people who use drugs unless they are working on recovery or treatment or whatever we define, again, as the ultimate goal. Um, it also respects the dignity, humanity, and autonomy of individuals, and that's what we do in medicine or should be doing in medicine. Lastly, it's evidence-based. We know certain service programs are associated with reductions in HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C. We know for sure that harm reduction does not increase rates of drug use. Overdose prevention centers, also, cause, also called supervised consumption sites or um, safe injection facilities, reduce HIV and overdose deaths. We know naloxone is cost-effective and absolutely saves lives. And we know that low threshold treatment programs um, are an example of how harm reduction can be integrated into treatment and have been demonstrated to have good retention. And at the core is this notion of any positive change, this idea that any step forward is a wonderful thing. And so if our goal is to promote health, then we, again, need to understand that people have their own circuitous paths. And it's not up to us to decide what the goal is. It's up to the person who's walking that path. And that each opportunity that we encounter someone is an opportunity for forward movement towards what it is that they're working on, um, towards health and wholeness. And it doesn't matter how small that step is. If that's getting, you know, hepatitis A vaccine or hepatitis B vaccine, that's amazing. That is forward um, movement towards health health. This idea of kind of high threshold versus low threshold care, I think is really important, especially when we think about um, a lot of the talk around coerced models that are not only high threshold, but involuntary. Um, you know, thinking about why do we need low threshold treatment? Well, people who use drugs face numerous barriers to engage in services. So first, the registration threshold. If any of you have tried to access care for a loved one or yourself or a patient or a participant you're working with, you know that the system is designed to be impossible to access. Um, it is very hard to find good care. You're often made to call multiple places to be on wait lists. It's hard to know even what you're getting. Um, and so that's sort of that first hurdle to get over. There's then the competence threshold. You have to actually be able to communicate what it is that you need. Um, and that takes an amazing amount of trust for people who, many of whom their experience may have been that systems of care, again, are not trustworthy places. Then there's the efficiency threshold. And I love this quote from someone who's interviewed as a part of this um, low threshold study. You said, you know, what about that person who needs a thousand cups of coffee before they're even going to speak about their need? If you have a high threshold system where you have to call multiple times, get on a wait list, show up on time, be polite, make it through an intake process, um, fit into sort of a one size fits all treatment approach, you're never going to be able to access care or get your needs met. And so low threshold care is really this idea of lowering the barriers to really reduce, reduce those thresholds through less stringent eligibility criteria to try to broaden the potential reach. And those threshold treatment models are flexible. They're focused on engagement. They're meant to be welcoming and voluntary. And they've been demonstrated to reach populations who've been made to be marginalized or vulnerable, who may be dealing with more competing priorities and chaos in their lives. And part of the, um, the sort of philosophy behind this is that we know cumulative treatment duration has positive health outcomes, even for people who are cycling in and out of treatment, that it doesn't have to be this linear approach. And this is a really powerful study that's now um, old, but I think still very much relevant in the midst of the over 
overdose crisis. This looked, um, this is in the British Medical Journal, and it looked at the probability of not dying before someone ultimately stopped using opioids by exposure to opioid agonist therapy, so methadone or buprenorphine. And you can see that in the group that got no medication treatment ever, um, the dramatic difference in their probability of dying, um, especially when you get out to sort of 30 years after first injection, compared to those who'd had greater than five years of exposure. And this is not sort of in one treatment since this is cumulative. So you may come in for a month, three months, five months, you may be going in and out of methadone treatment, for example, but that cumulative treatment does have a protective effect. And so if we if we know that, then really making care easy to access becomes incredibly important. The other reality is that the risk of dying is 10 times higher when you're on a waiting list to get into medication treatment than if you're, than if you're accepted. And so why are we creating systems that even have waiting lists amidst the worst overdose crisis in history, knowing that people are going to be at high risk of dying? And why are we focusing on involuntary treatment models when we have such a tremendous need to expand, broaden um, our voluntary treatment system. And patients um, tell us about the power of low threshold care. So this is a qualitative study we did about our bridge clinic, which is a low barrier, low threshold care model, um, where patients talked about what it had been like to receive care in that type of model. And um, these are some quotes, you know, that the clinic allowed them to heal however they had to, that the clinic didn't make them feel like other places do. They don't bombard you. Instead, it's just such a relief and a help. They allow you to heal and don't try to bring rules and make things mandatory. One person said, you know, they didn't withhold medication because I hadn't done something that I was supposed to or force me to sit and go to meetings. They didn't make my medication contingent upon either being successful or some other type of treatment that oftentimes I found personally to have the opposite effect. And then lastly, staff treat you like you're a person and try to make your life better. They make everybody here feel welcome. So if you've got somewhere to go where people are happy to see you, you'll probably keep going. So with that, I want to end this quote with this quote, which I think really gets at the core of all of this, that so much of our policy, our approaches as a society have been focused on punishing people who use drugs and making their lives worse and harder, sometimes under the smokescreen of help, as if we're trying, as if we're actually sort of um, going to help someone under that tough love hitting bottom um, ideology. And yet the reality is that hope and growing aspirations for a better life can be a catalyst for chain change, often more than a desire to escape pain. And if our intent is to affirm wellness and every encounter and to provide support that makes this movement towards health possible, we really need to think about that um, holding hope, engagement, welcoming, compassion, welcoming people in with open arms. And what are the policies we need to create to be able to sustain that? Um, and certainly continuing to exist in a, in a world where our policies around criminalizing, punishing, confining, um, imprisoning people who use substances will never allow us to expand and fully operationalize a model that welcomes people in. So with that, um, I will end and I'm very happy to take questions. Um, I can look in the chat and also um, the Q&A. And thank you guys so much for having me. Thank you so much, Dr. Wakeman. Uh, we're, we're probably not going to have time for, for Q&A at this point. We're going to move into the next session, but we are so grateful for your work on these issues and for you spending so much time putting together such a great presentation, so comprehensive um, one that clearly explains the harms of stigmatizing, labeling people who, who use drugs. And uh, yes, thank you so much for just carving out time to be with us today. Um, we're going to move um, straight into our next segment. Uh, we're just a couple minutes over time. Uh, the next segment, uh, as you can see from the agenda, is a panel discussion that will expand on what Dr. Wakeman just talked about, uh, the harms of criminalization. And uh, first, I'd like to introduce my colleague who will be moderating the session, Eliza Cohen. Uh, Eliza is a research coordinator in the Department of Research and Academic, en Academic Engagement at DPA, where she works to bridge the divide between research and effective drug policies. She helps convene researchers to discuss emerging drug policy issues and help develop evidence-based policies. And through training, webinars, and publications, she gives researchers the tools and skills to get involved in policy advocacy and develop policy relevant research. Um, right. And incidentally, Eliza is also a, an alum of Middlebury College. Um, so we're so excited to have you here today, Eliza, and Eliza will begin the next session momentarily. Thanks for sticking with us, everyone. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm so happy to be here with you all today, and I'm really excited to be here with these um, Excellent, excellent panelists. We have a really good lineup. I wish we had uh, an hour to talk to each of them, um, but unfortunately, probably for them as well, we only have an hour. <laughs> uh, 
Um, but I'm I'm really excited for this next um, conversation. So I'll invite each of you um, to introduce yourselves after I ask uh, this first question. So to get us started, I wanted to pick up on a few things that Cassandra said during the introduction of today's event. She said that for the past half a century or more, We've invested literally a trillion dollars into punitive systems, into fear-based public education, and into low-quality coercive treatment. And it's been resoundingly more harmful than helpful. So what excites me about today's panel is that you all have written and spoken about the ways that the criminal legal system has been harmful, but you each bring a slightly different lens to it. So can each of you tell us a bit about your backgrounds and how your work and experiences have led you to do this work investigating and, communi and communicating about the harms and failures of our drug laws? And I'll, and I'll invite each of you to talk for a minute, two minutes or so. Um, Morgan, can I start with you, please? Yeah, hey, hello. Uh, my name is Morgan Godvin. I'm in Portland, Oregon. And here I serve on multiple state boards and commissions. I'm on the statewide Alcohol and Drug Policy Commission. I'm on the county local public safety coordinating council. Um, and then the really impactful one is Oregon's drug decriminalization measure 110 oversight and accountability council. And that is the body that does the grant making. So when we decriminalized drugs, we also funded a treatment and harm reduction system all across the state using our cannabis tax revenue. So I sit on the body that actually oversees that and awards the grants. And I do this because I am a person with lived experience. Because when I look out my window, I literally see the site of my first arrest where I was uh, given multiple felonies for drug possession, except I was put into the kinder, gentler alternative that is drug court but because I continued using, I ended up um, in jail to the point where I had to withdraw from all my classes. I got fired from my job and ended up homeless. I was forced detoxed off of my Suboxone in the county jail. And I just had these experiences in rapid succession that, <laughs> you know, it took me a second, but I was like, huh maybe the criminal justice system is not helpful because <laughs> I had sort of like had this like tacit belief that like, well, what else is it there for? So very embarrassingly, the first time I actually went to jail and didn't get released on my own recognizance, I volunteered because I thought they would stabilize me on my box. And so, yeah, but uh, I learned. But now all of those lived experiences I have and all of the people that I lost to overdose that were incarcerated repeatedly first, this informs everything that I do. And I try to center that in my work as I toil away in policy rooms. Thank you, Morgan, for your work and for toiling away. I also <laughs> want to note that uh, Morgan's wearing a Beats Overdose ah. shirt, um, which um, and this is Morgan's organization working to provide harm reduction services um, to the music industry. So thank you for that as well. Thank you. Um, Jennifer, can I come to you? Hi, good morning. Um, so my name is Jennifer Carroll. I'm coming to you from Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, I'm a medical anthropologist by training, um, but I've been a harm reductionist much longer than I've been a medical anthropologist. Um, overdose is something that has been touching my life since I was a child. Um, when I was in high school, um, I went to a, a, a fancy school in North Dallas. Um, and at one of our Sort of community institutions, like a whole smattering of high school juniors and seniors died of overdose um, at the sort of like creme de la creme public school in Plano, Texas. Um, and even then, uh, as naive as we were, there was still this huge discussion among my peer group of like, yeah, that's what happens when there's no drug education and teenagers don't know that you can't, you know, do heroin and then go to a keg party 
and pile a bunch of alcohol on top and everything will be okay, right? Um, it continued when I was in college and there were people who fortunately survived but experienced overdose in dorm rooms alone behind closed doors because they were afraid of getting into trouble. Um, and it, you know, continues to this day. We were just at the Drug Policy Alliance meeting a couple of weeks ago and Granted, we had a little bit of a, a period off thanks to COVID, um, but while it was extremely uh, joyful and uh, fed my soul to be around so many people that are so dear to me, it was like one of the most haunted events I have been to because there are like so many people who just very viscerally weren't there, right? Um, and I remember even at the last little bit, um, uh, Maya Simpkins, for those who know her, making this comment um, and, and it, I won't mention who, but it could be like six people <laughs> that I'm referring to saying that like, you know, if we lost this person, if this person wasn't able to navigate today's drug supply, nobody could do it. Right. And so what I've really been focused on in, in my work ever since I left direct service um, to do more sort of research and to leverage some of my interests and some of my talents and some of my privilege to um, sort of unpack these really big questions about what we're doing and what impact it's having on us and our, 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 us as a society and the, the members of that society, um, have really focused on sort of what are the things that shape overdose risk. Um, you know, using drugs is not risk-free, but I like to point out that I get um, into a seat that is about 12 inches away from an active combustion engine every single day when I go to work. And that's wild if you think about it. Um, and there's lots of things that are done to ensure that that is a relatively safe thing that I do. Um, so safety is something that we create, or it is something that we obliterate <laughs> based on our policy responses to things. Um, and uh, and really focusing on sort of what are the evidence-based strategies that can be used to end overdose. And I continue to insist that we could end overdose tomorrow. We have the tools to do it. We know what works. We're just not doing it uh, partially because stigma stops us from doing it because like I said, I'm an anthropologist. I trade in stories. Like that's what I what I really focus on. And we tell ourselves a lot of stories that, make it seem like a bad thing to do the stuff that we know works. And also one of the things that I've learned recently doing a broad like analysis of the treatment that's available in North Carolina where I live is that a lot of people, I think the vast majority of people are under the impression that we have fixed a lot of broken things that remain giant dumpster fires. Um, like treatment is not available. <laughs> Treatment's not available, it's just not. Um, if you want a place in North Carolina that is residential, has a license to operate, doesn't make you work 60 hours a week without pay and lets you have access to medication, there's 87 slots for you in this whole state of 8 million people, right? So everything is garbage. Um, but I've also been looking at uh, criminalization, the impacts of drug-induced homicide laws on overdose risk, the impact of drug market disruption, either from coincidence or from police activity on drug markets. Um, and I think if you take one thing away from this conversation, it's that we no longer have growing evidence that criminalization drives overdose. It is incontrovertible that criminalization drives overdose um, among people who do this science. That is not a controversial statement. Um, and every single evidence-based strategy that we have is a carve out of criminalization and that's precisely why they work. Um, so I'll stop there because I'm really excited to hear from Felina and I could just go on for a while. So <laughs> thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I want to, yeah. we're going to come back to a lot of um, the studies that you mentioned in mm -hmm. a lot of your work. Um, but I want to repeat that statement. You said it, it is incontrovertible that criminalization mm -hmm. drives overdose. Yeah. yeah. Um, People may not have access to the information. Yeah. That's how the world works. That's how information works. But the information we have is the, the non-controversial conclusion is that criminalization causes overdose. Yes. <laughs> thank you for that. Um, Valina, I'll turn to you now. Uh, hi, I absolutely second what uh, Dr. Carroll was saying, and I come from uh, the perspective of working within the criminal legal system. So I'm Valina Beatty. I am a law professor at Indiana University Mauer School of Law in Bloomington, uh, and I am also a wrongful convictions uh, litigator. So that's uh, where I'm at now. Where I started was as a prosecutor, uh, and I was a federal prosecutor and a number of my cases uh, had drug charges in them. And I saw 
being a prosecutor, I saw the system fail. Uh, I saw the same folks cycling back through uh, again. And I saw the intense dehumanization of people uh, who were charged with some kind of a drug offense. Uh, literally, people would just shorthand say in the office, oh, this defendant who, and I, it's shameful to repeat it, but I think it's important, this defendant who is a crack whore, like just that language being used repeatedly uh, to justify the prosecutions, right? Uh, we're all lawbreakers, right? We've all like jaywalked, for example, but <laughs> I did today. Uh, but only certain people get that label of being a criminal and getting the stigma against them. So I moved from being a prosecutor to being a wrongful convictions litigator, and I saw that same stigma track. Um, so I focus mainly on um, in wrongful convictions, uh, folks who are queer and women who are wrongly convicted. But for my clients who had uh, substance use issues or had drug charges or even were in treatment, that was all used against them to justify prosecuting them for something they didn't do, right? So these are people who are innocent but prosecutors justify bringing these charges because of some connection with drug use. Uh, so that's that's my background in this, and I'm I'm really happy to be here. Thank you, Aliza. Thank you so much, Valina. Um, yeah, so often drugs or drug use is used as a proxy to criminalize and dehumanize people. So thank you for uplifting that. Um, with that, let's dive in. Um, as I'm pulling up the next question, I'll just say I love I I love being in conversation with. Um, Morgan Bellina and Jennifer, because they're an excellent example of academic researchers who know how to talk to people who do work beyond peer reviewed publications, who write op eds, who talk to the media, who organize, who do harm reduction work. Um, so, again, I'm really thrilled to be in conversation with you all and that the audience today in Vermont is hearing from you guys. So, we want to get started with a question about the nexus of overdose and criminalization. As we've talked about, this panel comes at a time when fatal overdose rates nationwide and in Vermont continue to set new records. We've lost over 400,000 people in the U.S. just since the emergence of COVID, and this crisis, crisis doesn't seem to be anywhere close to subsiding. There are some who might think that arresting people who use drugs and people who sell drugs is going to prevent overdoses. So I first want to turn to you, Jennifer, since you've been researching issues related to this topic. Can you talk about how the impacts of arrests on over, can you talk about the impacts of arrests on overdose risk for individuals who use drugs? And then also tell us about your research on community-wide impacts of enforcement actions on overdose rates. Yeah, um, so I think uh, super briefly, I want to mention, um, I was in a faculty meeting before this, so I didn't get to see all of Dr. Wakeman's presentation. She likely said, and I know in the past, she has said this very, she's made this very helpful observation that um, uh, substance use disorders can be broadly understood as uh, situations where people are challenged to change their relationship to cease use or reduce use in spite of the negative consequences that they incur because of that use, whether it's like, you know, a natural God-given consequence of heroin or whether it's a consequence we impose on them, right? And so if the the condition is defined by the uh, continued lack of success in behavior change in spite of negative consequences, what do we think that piling on more negative consequences is going to do? And I would say there are entire disciplines out there, social work, psychology, psychiatry, who um, have been studying human behavior change for a very long time. We know how behavior change works, right? And it's primarily through agency and empowerment and not through um, you know, a swift kick in, in the rear end, which is how I've heard a lot of people describe a, a weekend in jail. Um, so uh, there's a, a couple of uh, different threads um, that are open in terms of really trying to document something that people who have been working in harm reduction and drug use or health have known and been saying for a very, very long time. I think that's one of the tragic ironies of the work that I do. I feel like it's a privilege to learn from so many dedicated and experienced and, and just very, very thoughtful and intelligent people. But I'm also aware that like 
part of my contribution is writing down and sort of like authenticating stuff that people have already known to be true. And one of the things that we've been hearing forever is that disruption to the market is driving overdose, that criminalization is driving people into more harmful behaviors. And that's kind of true across the board. And so the place, you know, I can talk about my journey of learning this. One of the places where I first came to appreciate how big of a factor this is, is when I was living in Providence, Rhode Island, and I was spending a lot of time in the ER, um, really late nights, uh, drank a lot of really crappy coffee out of styrofoam cups, um, ate a lot of cafeteria pizza from Cisco, and uh, was there meeting up with people who had been reversed from an opioid overdose, uh, met by EMS and transported to the hospital. So that's not everybody, but it was a lot of folks who had an overdose reversed. And what I was able to do um, uh, some people were not interested, but most people were very generous with their time and their patience and were willing to talk to me. And so some of the questions I had were like, hey, I'm just trying to understand your situation and like how we ended up here and what could be helpful. And so with a lot of them, I'm like, you use dope like every day and you've been doing this every day for a long time um, and you're not stupid. So what happened today? Like, why is today different than every other day? How did you end up here? Um, and so about half of the people that I met, uh, I think I might describe as intermittent users. You know, there was one guy that was like, oh, I haven't used heroin since the 90s. What is fentanyl? You know, or someone else who like went to a party and trusted Jeremy's advice and is like, I'm never listening to Jeremy again. But there's also a huge chunk of folks who were very experienced with the illicit drug supply. And the feedback that I got from them consistently, without exception, was that they could not go to their quote unquote, number one guy for supply that day. There was some reason why that person couldn't be found. Uh, they were arrested. Um, they were out of town for a wedding. Uh, they were just hanging out with other people and they couldn't cross town. So it's all kinds of circumstances. And so they either had to borrow supply from someone else in order to get off E, in order to manage withdrawal and kind of stay well. Um, they had to um, buy from someone they were less familiar with just because number one person was not answering their phone. Folks always had backups, but they're like, you know, it's like the second cat sitter, the second babysitter, the, the second person to invite to whatever you're doing. It's like, you just don't know them quite as well, even if you're like, they're nice people. And one person articulated to me really clearly that he's like, oh man, yeah, it's always more dangerous to go to your number two guy. And I was like, okay, I'm hearing this from a lot of people. Can you explain this to me? And um, and he he just explained like it's less it's less familiar, right? Um I like to clarify, especially with my students a lot when we talk about these issues, that the the difference between, and I think really fundamentally, a very, very important difference between, for example, Oxycontin and heroin. Um, Oxycontin was a massive public health problem. Lots of people were dying. It was worthy of our attention. But the curves that we see from the CDC tell us that it is nowhere near as dangerous as heroin and nowhere near as dangerous as fentanyl. And a huge reason why is because Oxycontin comes with a dose. Like it's literally on the label. Like you know how much you're getting. And with the illicit supply, you are in you know, level one to level five spicy curry territory, right? I mean, like that's literally, it's a qualitative measure where you don't know exactly how much you're getting. And um, I don't mean to be glib at all. I think this is like the most uh, excellent analogy I can have. Like imagine going to a brand new Indian restaurant and they're like, do you want mild, medium or spicy? And you're like, what's medium here? right? I could be extremely disappointed one way or the other, depending on what I get out. And so if that's all you have to really communicate what's going on with the supply you have, even the most diligent, even the most communicative, even the most attempting to be helpful and look out for each other, people who are trading drugs can miscommunicate. And that miscommunication, misunderstanding or accident can be potentially fatal. Um, I'm not the only researcher that has found that. We found it across the country. And that's not surprising because people across the country have been saying that's true for years. Um, most recently, we were able to quantify this in Indianapolis. Um, so my colleague, Brad Ray at RTI, um, was able to obtain evidence or excuse me, property room data. So essentially evidence that was seized by the Indianapolis Municipal Police. Um, so whether they're raiding a house, uh, they pulled someone over and found 
contraband in the, you know, in the like cup holder, like whatever it might be. If they seize drugs off of somebody, they take it back to the police station and they store it and they log it. And we had access to that log. So we knew what they put in there, approximately how much, when they got it, the date, the time, the location, all this great detail. And we also have really good data for EMS and for overdose death from the state that has date, time, location, and we were able to look at how fatal and non-fatal overdoses cluster in the time and space around those drug seizures. And our hypothesis based on all of this qualitative, like exploratory interview research that we had done that were like, we have a well-documented plausible mechanism by which these small disruptions could be creating more overdose risk, right? Imagine if you're even just a single person, you need some heroin or fentanyl now because it's 2023 20, to get you through the day and you have spent the last of your money. And if that gets seized, whether or not you get arrested, like what choices do you have for the rest of the day? One is to just be physically miserable, um, which, uh, you know, if you've not been through withdrawal, I can't explain how strong a muscle the brain is and how viciously it will keep you from doing anything to experience that again. <laughs> it's awful. Um, and so everything else other than just being miserable involves suboptimal choices, right? Of a, of a variety of, of, of degrees. So when we looked at this, we were, our question was kind of like, well, is the impact going to be big enough to even see in the data, because we're talking about sometimes really small seizures. And the impact was actually much more significant than even we expect. I was surprised um, by how much it has. So what we found was that not in the time surrounding, but only in the time after opioid seizures of any size, fatal overdose doubled within a 500 meter radius over the next two weeks. And it was a higher rate if we had a smaller radius and only looked at the seven days afterwards, right? So really significant, uh, statistically significant and like exponentially significant changes in overdose following opioid seizures. We didn't see the same thing with stimulant seizures because we know that stimulants don't work the same way. Stimulant overdose doesn't work the same way. And small disruptions in the stimulant market can have very real effects on people, but is not going to take you into this like small accidents could be fatal territory very quickly. And so that was kind of our control, right? So we know always like the, the overdose has always followed seizures, that we weren't seeing it with other types of drugs, um, that it involved fatal and non-fatal overdoses. There were more naloxone administrations, everything. And we're working right now on um, some follow-up analyses. Uh, and so we have sort of back up, back of the envelope numbers that aren't totally um, uh, verified yet. So like watch this space. It'll be out in peer review, hopefully in the next few months, but we are pretty sure that we're seeing a dose response effect, which means that like dose response basically means like the more of the thing you get, the more of the effect you get. So if you drink twice as much liquor, you get twice as intoxicated. We're seeing a, we think that we're seeing a dose response effect with the amount of opioids seized. Um, and we're also seeing really strong correlations with community mental health as well. Um, so places, um, I would have to go back to the data. I don't remember exactly, but it's, there's certain indicators. It's either depression or cardiac health or both that are, I mean, other indicators of like social determinants of health, people that have access to healthcare, being poor is stressful, being poor is unhealthy, um, being racially discriminated against is stressful and unhealthy. Um, so those things are inequitably spread across our population. And that seems to be increasing the impact as well. Um, I'll, one last thing I'll mention is just that we've also seen similar impacts. Um, at least we've seen proof of concept of similar impact after high profile drug induced homicide cases. Uh, we have uh, grounded um, evidence from a county in Western North Carolina where we saw the effects of a high profile case really dramatically disrupt the drug supply because people were uh, feeling feelings and uh, making choices in response to that that put a lot of people at very, very high risk. And so I would not be surprised if we while we're continuing to look, we see that elsewhere too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much for that really thorough um, answer, Dr. Carroll. You, something you mentioned at the end brings us nicely into our next question, which is to zoom out a bit and to look at um, not just the impacts of arrest on overdose, but to look at some of the broader health harms of criminalization and sure. also the uh, broader community-wide health impacts of police interactions. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking about these, um, the harms of criminalization in three domains. So first, 
they're the broad and documented health harms of arrest, prosecution, and incarceration, which we'll dig into more. Second, there have been a lot of studies looking at the impacts of heightened police engagement on health, even absent arrest or incarceration. Studies have shown, for example, that men who live in certain neighborhoods where they were more likely to be stopped and searched were more likely to report feelings of anxiety, severe feelings of worthlessness or depression, and in that it, in that it increased the risk of a diabetes diagnosis, high blood pressure, and the risk of an asthmatic episode. And this policing negatively impacts not just those individuals but all who experience police encounters, but also entire neighborhoods where there are higher rates of police force. So that's the second domain. The third domain is that there are health harms that arise down the line from the impacts of ha having an arrest or conviction record. So for example, a 2016 longitudinal study found that an arrest resulted in a 42% decrease in the likelihood of attending a four-year college directly after high school. A 2014 study found that an arrest record can decrease the odds of a jo job callback by as much as 40%. And not having a job or not being in school can all worsen health outcomes, especially for people who use drugs. So I want to turn to all of you now um, to see if you can all talk a bit about either reflecting on the data or more personal direct insights on arrest and prosecutions about how policing, how arrests, how prosecutions and incarceration are all worsening health outcomes, both at the individual and community level. Um, Morgan, could I start with you? Yeah. This is something that I've been thinking about a lot because last week, a delegation of 24 Oregonians, including many elected officials, went to Portugal um, to look at their decriminalization system. We met with the police, harm reduction, all the way through. And I was talking to a drug user, <clears throat> and I asked him if he was afraid of the police. He didn't understand the question. I said, what? Are you afraid of the police? What are you talking about? Why would I be afraid of the police? And it just shook me to my core because of the PTSD that I have. I was getting pulled over every week, every other week. Um, you know, a very important context to this is, you know, I'm from like a poorer suburb of Portland. Um, it's one of the widest cities in America and we have some of the worst racial disparities and a really common profiling technique from the police here is just if you drive a crappy car um, and so because I did I was getting pulled over constantly um, often at gunpoint I was I've been raided by the SWAT team twice um, they could have just knocked I would have answered the door you didn't have to do all that. Um, but I, anecdotally, I can just feel the lingering effects of that. And mostly it manifests as PTSD. If I think like a light is being shined out my window, I get this jump startle reflex. And when I first got out of prison so i went to prison for drug delivery resulting in death which is something that i've worked with um, dr carol on i had an episode of psychosis an actual psychosis episode because i was so hyper vigilant all the time and particularly around surveillance because you know when i sat in jail and saw my discovery i'm flipping through the page i'm seeing pictures of myself you know the dea are taking pictures of me and seeing the entire contents of my cell phone where i'm lamenting the loss of my mom who died of a drug overdose and talking to my family about wanting to kill myself. And then I'm seeing these text messages in like my DEA case file. Just that level of, of hypervigilance and surveillance, you never move past that. So even now, now today, I'm an alcohol and drug policy commissioner and a public health researcher and I'm all these things. And you'd think that I'd like be able to put it behind me because logically I know I'm no longer the target of police activity or a DEA investigation. The lingering 
psychological effects of that are so profound. Um, I'm very fortunate that I have veterans healthcare access because when I had that bout of psychosis, who knows what would have happened had did I not have immediate high quality health care. Most people getting out of prison in Oregon have Medicaid at least. Um, in many states, people don't have health insurance at all when they get out. Could you imagine trying to deal with the health effects of the, you know, the mental health effects of PTSD in addition to physical health? And so that's something that I think about a lot. And then just, you know, the collateral consequences that continue to haunt me to this day. And I am one of the most privileged people to contact the, you know, have criminal justice system contact. When I look at my life today, you know, I've been able to get a good job and I've been able to surmount in so many of these barriers. So I recognize my privilege. And if these things affect me, if they're this detrimental to me, can you imagine what more marginalized people are going through? Um, yeah. That just really breaks my heart. But every single time a police officer pulls up behind me, I, you know, get the white knuckle and and can barely breathe. And I just think of that guy in Portugal who goes, why would I be afraid of the police? I don't commit crime. I smoke crack, <laughs> you know? Uh, it just doesn't need to be like this the the harms from you know mental health physical health collateral consequences these harms are so documented sometimes i feel like we're framing this as like a debate like oh everyone share your opinions on whether or not this is harmful no this is settled science thank you so much for that morgan um Valina, what do you have to add for you, from your vantage point, either formally as a prosecutor or your work with wrongfully convicted women? Yeah, well, thank you, Morgan, for sharing your personal experience and talking about how it still stays with you today. Uh, and I think something we maybe haven't talked about enough is the number of people who have served time for a crime and are on probation or parole. Uh, so just some numbers from the Prison Policy Initiative, 3.6 million people in the U.S. on probation, 840,000 on parole. Uh, and Think of all of those people who ha are surveilled. This is, you know, a surveillance mechanism, surveillance state. They have to keep up with all these requirements. And how many of those people are drug tested? Whether or not uh, the um, offense for which they serve time had anything to do with a controlled substance, it's often just a standard requirement to do drug testing just as part of being on parole or probation. And the sad, sad result of this is the number of people who are in prison, incarcerated, just because of a probation or parole violation, not even because of a true offense uh, or for what they initially went to prison for, but for this probation or parole violation. And that can be simply, um, you know, a dirty urine. So I just think it's important to tie into this, the surveillance of our criminal legal system right now, the money that states put into surveillance and to have these constant requirements. And also each probation officer is going to be different. So you don't know what your requirements are going to be like if you're moved from probation officer to probation officer. Uh, so I just think that's a key part of stopping people from moving on after being incarcerating, stopping them from actually being able to be successful and instead cycling them back through again. Thank you so much for that, Valina. Um, yeah, I think the probation and parole is such an under talked about um, part of the criminal legal system. And in fact, more people are on probation and parole than are locked up in jails and prisons. So it's super important. Um, Jennifer, can I invite you in and I'll ask you um, if you could talk a little bit about specifically the um, uh, harms of incarceration or post overdose risk post incarceration. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, incarceration is um, awful for public health. Um, I feel like that's also not a controversial statement. It shouldn't be. Um, and so, I mean, a lot of the work about this um, has come from a few states. Um, I'm proud to say that the Department of Health and Human Services in North Carolina has spearheaded a lot of this research. Um, and so we know um, from data in this state that between 2000 and 2015, people who were released from our state prison system were 74 times more likely to overdose on heroin than normal. 74 times more likely. That's is that 7,000%? Is that how the significant figures were? It's a lot of percentages. Uh, more likely to overdose um, in the first two weeks after release. Um, and that is because, um, again, we are back in sort of qualitative, mushy territory. Um, but the same way that fluctuation in the drug supply and people not being able to uh, really know what sort of a dose that they're looking at. Um, it, I think for all of this, it's really, really helpful to conceptualize the opposite of overdose, not as abstinence, but as proper dosing. Because if we know anything, it is that these drugs can be used extremely safely. And I can't overemphasize that. Or not. Like it's not the fentanyl y'all. It's never been the fentanyl. It's the context in which the fentanyl is used. We use fentanyl as part of a regular uh, anesthetic battery in ORs for tummy tucks, hernias, append appendectomies, 50, 60,000 times a day in this country with virtually no negative impact. And yet in this other context, people are dying to the tune of 100,000 people a year, right? And so the challenge is that if we cannot, if we have this fluctuation in our drug supply, then people are not able to dose properly, right? So the opposite of overdosing is properly dosing. And that means you've got to know what the dose is. That means you got to know what your tolerance is. And if your tolerance has gone down because you have spent time in abstinence, that means either you've gone through a period of um, elective abstinence, like you have decided to stop using. And then for a host of reasons, you initiated use again, um, which is totally normal. Um, as an anthropologist, I cringe at like universal claims about humans like if i watch that show bones and emily deschanel is like anthropologically speaking i like have to leave the room um but if i'm very very comfortable saying universally that humans use drugs that's a thing we have always done whether you like to chew on a leaf or eat a pill or if you go on roller coasters you do drugs you're just getting that heroin from your brain and not from jeremy down the street right um and so if people go through these periods of abstinence then their tolerance goes down they don't know what their tolerance is and again even people who are being super careful and really cautious still have this large capacity to misestimate and those misestimations can be lethal um we also know that involvement in incarceration can really disrupt um, a lot of the protective factors that we have. Um, so for instance, um, we know that people who are, there's multiple studies that show this, and also it's common sense, that are forced to withdraw from their medication in prison are so much less likely to re-engage with that medication. Um, I mean, like imagine, <laughs> hey Morgan, uh, so I mean like imagine you have a personal trainer that like physically assaults you every time you like don't do reps correctly. You're going to stop going to that personal trainer no matter how much exercise and cardio health would help you, right? And if you are use, relying on opioid agonist medications and you are forced into a position where they take you off of them and that puts you through a lot of pain, you're not going to be as willing to set yourself up for that kind of physical abuse at the hands of people who are in charge of you again. Um, and then we also know that, um, you know, the lack of care in prisons creates safety issues as well, right? And this is something that we've heard from people on the inside a lot, it's just like withdrawing in jail, you bump into people, and that can go poorly for everybody. So Morgan, you had wanted to. Hear oh, me I was just going to say, I never took my Suboxone again after mm -hmm. being forced detox mm -hmm. off of it in jail mm -hmm. and developed a deep seated uh, hesitation to be on any medication that required daily dosing, even five, 10 years after that, even mental health medications. Mm -hmm. And now, now I know looking at the data that my personal anecdote is actually reflected in the wider and that, you know, again, serving time in prison, like what you said around safety. I mean, <clears throat> Suboxone is such a hot commodity in our jails and prisons. People get stabbed over it. Yeah. What if we just gave it to people who needed it? <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Oh, yeah. And so many. So I work with the Prison Books Collective in my state. Um, and so many of the challenges that we face just providing services to our community members on the inside um, all boil down to the fear of not just drugs, but like Suboxone specifically being smuggled into our prisons as contraband. Um, we're shadow banned from a bunch of places. Our state is spending gobs of my tax dollars, um, paying third party companies to manage the mail, buying uh, iPads for the inmates. They can't have their own letters. They can't touch their kids' letters. Um, and it's all about drug diversion. And like I have for years have been like, or we could make basic medical care available to people, right? That's also an option. Um, and, and this relates um super briefly to a comment that was in the chat of like, well, what do we do about, you know, there's a lot of sort of like petty crime or or more than petty crime kind of associated with um, substance use and striking a balance so on and so forth. And I think this is true about uh, contraband in jails. I think this is true about all the nightmares that people have if they look at medications in a prison setting as a source of risk for that prison environment. And also just for communities that like people do desperate things when they are desperate. Right. Um, and when I was in Seattle working with the syringe exchange there, we had a problem for a while um, of people. Well, before our program expanded, there was a problem with people actually selling syringes back and forth to each other, which was kind of ethically hinky. Um, and we were able to basically, um, I don't want to say bring a stop to it, but it stopped because we just made syringe is more available because you can't sell something for a buck if you can walk down to the other side of the street and get two for free, right? Um, and if you have folks that are jockeying for Suboxone in jail, that's not a sign that Suboxone is dangerous. That's a sign that you have a demand for mm -hmm. a valid medication that responds to extremely real and visceral biological challenges that people face that is not being met. Um, and similarly, when the... Uh, uh, last point I'll make is that in the North Carolina um, analysis we did where we looked at how the drug-induced homicide case really changed the drug market, one of the things that we found was that in the short term, a lot of local sort of mid-tier suppliers diluted their drugs and made them a lot weaker because they were afraid of catching a case. Um, that eventually normalized out. So instead of like making the drug market safer, it just made it less predictable and more variable. But in the meantime, I was talking to these folks who are regular consumers and I was like, well, what did you do when all of the dope turned to garbage? And they were like, oh, you just have to buy twice as much. Um, and I welcome a conversation with that county sheriff about the public safety consequences of making the entire county's habit twice as expensive, right? And so and access to medication can also do so so like these are all signs of demand for basic evidence-based services that are not available is how I would frame that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I, I think uh now at this point, probably all hundred people in the audience are with us that uh criminalization is incredibly harmful uh to people who use drugs. Uh it impacts overdose, it impacts people's mental health, it has um, impacts far beyond um, an arrest or conviction. Um, it's called collateral consequences or mass impacts of a record. Um, and the impacts of surveillance are far reaching, both for people who use drugs or have been convicted of drugs, but as Valina said, also for people who have never used drugs, right? Lots of people have to take a drug test even if they've never used drugs. Um, so this was a great, great um, segment. I want to move now um, into talking about um, diversion programs um, or court-based treatment. Because many family members and friends who are often well-intentioned might feel like they've run out of options for their loved ones who are struggling with drug use. So there are a lot of people who generally agree that we need, need more access to treatment and supports for people who su suffer from substance use disorder, but maybe they've heard about drug courts and prosecutor-led diversion and believe that those are meaningful solutions to getting more people into treatment. There are even some states thinking about using opioid settlement committee funds for so-called, quote, treatment courts. So I'm wondering um, if Morgan and Valina can turn to you to talk about um, what you've seen with drug courts and treatment courts. Nancy, do you want to start? Um, I'll just take a step back and say, 
uh, you know, I'm in Indiana uh, and in a number of rural states, there's still this belief that just going to jail or going to prison is going to provide treatment. Uh, and I want to give a shout out to Wendy Bach's book, Prosecuting Poverty, Criminalizing Care, and I'll drop a link um, where, oh, we'll help people who are pregnant, women who are pregnant, and will protect the fetus uh, by putting them in jail so that they won't be using drugs. Okay, false that use of drugs is going to harm the fetus. That is false. That has been debunked scientific evidence, right? So that's false. And then second, so these women are put into jail for seven months, eight months. They're not getting treatment. They're sleeping in a jail. They're not even getting as much as they would be getting outside of that. And yet there's still this belief that, well, the as Morgan was saying, and, and her experience, oh, the criminal legal system is going to be the path to treatment. Um, so this shift towards drug courts is seen as, oh, well, we're moving away from jails and prisons, and this is softer and nicer, uh, but has many of its own harms uh, really attendant to it. And we know this now, right? We've had drug courts and we've had generations of drug courts long enough to be able to see their many failures. Um, so Morgan, I'll turn it over to you. I just always want, really want to differentiate when we say drug court, we're talking about two very different things. There is drug court for drug possession. And then there's drug court that's used like as a prison diversion for other types of crime. <clears throat> In practice, they look fairly similar, but... I just want to make that distinction because it frustrates me when, when people muddy them. I was put into the drug possession type of drug court. And by the time I got arrested, I'd already been struggling with addiction for years. Right. And I'd already suffered those natural consequences. It was affecting my relationships. It was affecting my finances. It was affecting uh, my job, <clears throat> school. And yet I kept using and then the state came in and said, hey, we're going to make your life hell if you keep using. Like, well, my life's already kind of hell, but I really thought that <clears throat> I really leaned into the system. You know, growing up white and middle class in a military family, I still had some deep seated notion that like the system is here to help. And I didn't want to want to lose my EMT license. You know, I'd worked really hard to get my EMT and get into paramedic school. I was like, okay, this is the line I will not cross in my addiction. You know, we said all these like lines on the sand, but how drug court works fundamentally is if you continue using, no matter what else you are complying with, you can jump through all of their hoops the treatment that they're offering usually is not evidence-based, you know, incredibly 12-step focused. I was having to, you know, call the UA line and go UA three times a day. The place was 20 miles from, my, I'm, I'm sorry, three times a week. Um, the place was 20 miles from my house. And then, you know, it's a year or a year and a half long program with all these weekly groups and UAs and all, it's just severely impacting people's ability to just live their life, have a job, parent their kids or what have you. But then on graduation day, or, you know, I didn't graduate. I just went to jail a bunch. In fact, I went to jail more than I would have had I just taken the plea deal. Exceptionally more because it would have been like five days or maybe even no jail time for just a drug possession charge in Portland. But because I opted into drug court, and then my second time I got sanctioned, the second time I was being brought before a judge to go to jail, I said, I, I'm I don't want to be in this program anymore. You know, it was I it was a voluntary pre-conviction um diversion pathway. So I self-terminated. I'm like, no, 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 I don't want to be in this program anymore. I'm terminating out. Just, you know, give me the jail time and let me go. And the judge says, no, no, I'm not letting you terminate. And I was like, this is a voluntary program. And she was like, 
too bad. I'm giving you a jail sanction and you're staying in the program. And I turned to my attorney and I said, can she do that? And he says, well, she just did. <laughs> so, um, you know, my experience was just, it, it's an extension of the criminal justice system. And anytime you give them discretion, a budget, a program, it will be used punitively that a judge gets to determine what methadone dose is appropriate or whether or not you should be on Suboxone is preposterous. The people in Portugal thought we were ludicrous for that because there's apps, you know, their medical doctor's advice is it. Obviously, they're the one who gets to officiate your medical care. That a non-trained judge could come in and dictate medical care is preposterous. But the numbers vary on what percentage of people graduate drug court um, here in Portland is about 30%. And they really would hold up these, these 30% of people and say, look at what we did. The criminal justice system is so good. We saved these 30%, these 30 of people from themselves. They found recovery. This is all because we exist and we are so benevolent and we have this drug court program aren't we amazing? And then, you know, those 30% of people tend to say things like this program saved my life. What about the other 70%? We never talk about them. That's the me's of the world. That's the me's who got sanctioned to jail so many times in drug court that I got fired and was unemployed for the first time in my entire addiction and ended up homeless. And 70% of the people in that program didn't graduate, which meant the vast majority had experiences like mine, where we were sanctioned <clears throat> repeatedly, did more time in jail than we would have had we just initially taken the felony and had all of the negative consequences that come from that. So getting warrants, getting aggressively arrested, strip search, jail, detoxing in jail because we, we know they're still not offering medications for opioid use disorder in most jails and prisons throughout the country. The number one intervention that we are using for substance use disorder is incarceration. And in all carceral facilities, it is exceedingly hard to access the gold standard treatment for, for opioid use disorder. And that is absolutely preposterous. Clearly, there's some exceptions here. A few states have made progress on that. But drug courts essentially justify har harms against the majority to loud the recovery, the success of a minority. And I think that calculus is so deeply unethical that they are saying that, you know, of my drug court class, that 30% recovery mattered more than my life itself. I'm so fortunate that I didn't overdose and die after being forced detoxed off of my Suboxone or during any of those jail sanctions. We know that period right after incarceration is incredibly high risk. And you know what? That 30% of people that graduated, they were probably the ones just eager for treatment. And just needed to be handed to it on a silver platter. It really had nothing to do with the criminal justice system or the threat of incarceration. They were, you know, that's about the population of people with a substance use disorder on any given day who would willingly engage in treatment. So they didn't get anything unique to the criminal justice system. They feel like they did, but if they just would have been offered that in a community setting, the outcome would have been the same. Yet we gatekeep and we put a vast majority of our treatment resources behind handcuffs and cell block doors. And that I just cannot get over how deeply offensive that is to me. Morgan, thank you. Well, yeah, go ahead. Second, again, that the, the folks who would have served less time if they hadn't gone into drug court, uh, that you'd get sent to jail repeatedly, repeatedly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. and then just really quick. Um, sorry. Yeah. So then I ended up with a whole nother felony. So while I was in drug court, I got pulled over and got um, 
a residue amount. I declined the search. He pulled me out of the car by my scruff and found a little piece of plastic that used to contain heroin and gave me a felony for residue amounts because he could see that I was in drug court, that I had just been arrested for felony possession in the other county. And so boom, boom, I get back to back felonies. And then six months later, my federal charge this is just oh, like right. I wouldn't have got the two felonies had I not been in drug court, you know, so like that criminal, how it just becomes this snowball. Once you get one foot in, it just snowballs. And then in the federal system, I had two possession felonies and I was on felony probation, which is two points. So I was a criminal history category three, as if I was some type of career criminal. I sold one gram of heroin. That was my offense. But because I was a criminal history category three, I was looking at sentences inflated by about 25% or so over if I had no criminal history at all. But my criminal history was evidence of an addiction. It was only low level drug possession. Yet that made me look like a criminal. And you see how these experiences just compound, the trauma compounds, criminal justice contact compounds until we dig ourselves so deep we can't get out. And all of a sudden I'm looking at 280 months in prison because I have a history of heroin use. Thank you so much for that, Morgan. That was really a masterclass um, in drug courts and 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 in how our um, systems are really set up to fail us. Um, I love how you ended um, with a brief glimpse on what our systems could be if they were actually helping us and were supportive. So we just have really one one more minute, <laughs> um, and so I want to invite each of our panelists to just say a few final words about. What would it look like if our systems were helping and supporting people who use drugs? It can be a few adjectives. It can be feeling, a color, whatever you want. Um, so Jennifer, can I start with you? Uh, yes, we would be letting go of narratives about drug use, about the need for tough love, the entire concept of enabling, the entire concept of rock bottom, and the general idea that the thing that people need more in the world is a swift kick in the ass. And we would let that go not only because it is wrong, but because we realize that it is very stupid to frame all of our policy and social responses and our relationships around a model that was designed to manage alcoholism among 40 middle-aged white men in the 1940s, because that's where that comes from. Right. Like all of these narratives have a history and also because we would recognize that the people who maintain authority over drug use in our society and government have been making stuff up for almost 150 years. We've been lied to our entire lives. Everything we think we know about drugs is very, very wrong. Um, but we have people like my colleagues on this call who are living proof of what the reality is. Um, so, yeah, we would we would let go of the stories that we know don't apply to us and pick up what we know actually works to improve lives. And we know what that is. Thank you so much, Dr. Carol. Valina, what would a system look like that actually supports and helps people? I would say humane and safe. Uh, the purpose ostensibly of the criminal legal system is to create safety. I know we had a question here about how do you balance um, uh, substance use with public safety. We know how to do that. We know ways to do that. And we know there are also uh, true and false narratives out there. So moving towards actually creating safety in our system instead. Thank you so much. And Morgan, what would a system look like that helps and supports people? Yeah, love is not tough. Love is kind. So it would look like autonomy. It would look like compassion and love. And it would value human life and dignity more than a puritanical notion of abstinence. Thank you so much. That's a beautiful note to end on. Um, I want to thank our panelists again, Dr. Jennifer Carroll, Felina Beatty, and Morgan Godvin um, for your time here today. A reminder to the audience um, that this event is being recorded and we'll send out the event along with the resources we put in the chat um, very soon in the coming days or next week. Um, we're going to take a quick pause, like a two minute pause. So to 12.05 if you're on East Coast time. Um, and I'll invite everyone to get some water, take a bathroom break, something else, whatever you need. 
Um, and thanks again to our panelists. We'll see you soon. Thank you so much, Eliza and Morgan, Jennifer, Valina, for that just incredibly powerful discussion. Uh, we're going to start our next segment. And uh, in this segment, we really wanted to pick up on many of the issues that they laid out for us in that last panel. Uh, but we also wanted to get a better sense of how these issues tend to, to manifest in Vermont. And for this, we turn to a Vermonter with really vast experience in the criminal legal system and expertise on criminal legal reform in uh, legislative capacities as well in the state. Uh, Professor Jessica Brown, um, and Professor Brown, whenever you wanna come on screen with us, that's great. Uh, Professor Brown is an assistant professor of law and director of the Center for Justice Reform at the Vermont Law and Graduate School in South Royalton. Uh, prior to joining the faculty at VLGS, Professor Brown worked for 24 years as a public defender in Vermont and New Hampshire uh, in both the state and federal systems, the criminal legal systems. As a public defender, Professor Brown represented adult clients charged with felonies, misdemeanors, probation violations, and, and some uh, post-conviction matters as well, and represented juveniles and parents in delinquency and other matters. Uh, Professor Brown currently serves on a legislative advisory panel to address racial disparities in the criminal and juvenile legal systems in Vermont. We asked Professor Brown to help us dig into what criminalization of people who use drugs really looks like in Vermont and what it often looks like and, and kind of help us uh, help explain what those systems really, really look like and how they work. Um, we're really honored that you accepted this invitation, Professor Brown. We're, uh, we, we, we really appreciate you taking time for this. Uh, I'm excited Hi. to have you here. Thanks. I'm, I'm really excited to have you here because I think that the perspective you bring is just incredibly valuable. Um, not only do you bring insights about the criminal legal system, but I think having spent more than two decades actually counseling clients and, and helping them navigate the collateral consequences of criminalization gives insights that, that I think a lot of policymakers might not have. So I'm excited to bring that to the conversation today. Um, and, and to get us started, I really just wanted to talk, uh, at least from your experience, and I know this is, this is not necessarily a data-driven question, but, um, you know, in our analysis, it really appears that a large percentage of drug arrests in the state, um, and we, we look back from 2018 to 2021, three quarters of those arrests were for what we often refer to as low-level drug offenses, um, is that consistent with your experience? I would you say the vast majority of the drug cases you handled were fairly low level? Certainly in the state system, yes. And we're just talking about Vermont. So uh, I should, uh, well, first of all, thanks for having me. I am uh, glad to be here to talk about this with you today. Um, and to clarify about my work as a public defender, I only worked in the federal system in New Hampshire, and I would say that the types of uh, the types of drug cases you see in the federal system are very different than the types that you see in the state system. Um, in the state system, I would say that for the most part, they were pretty low level drug offenses. Um, you know, often resulting from controlled buys by you know uh, informants working with the police or undercover police officers. So in those circumstances, we're not talking about controlled buys. Like it's not like a, you know, TV storyline where it's a controlled buy of like a huge amount from a trafficker. We're talking about a controlled buy of a small personal use amount from, you know, a person who most likely is a user themselves. And you know, it, it sounds like there are parts of the state where you don't see, and certainly now, uh, as many of these types of, you know, possessory offenses, just low-level possessory offenses. But um, can you describe? I mean, do you do you get a sense that it differs depending on where you live in the state? Uh, definitely does. Um, so hopefully, mm -hmm. our audience uh, of Vermonters knows that the top prosecutor in each county is called the state's attorney, and that's an elected position. And uh, so the policies that our elected state's attorneys bring to their counties are individual, you know, for, for the most part. Um, 
So different prosecutors, different states attorneys are going to have different policies and different positions on things like um, arrests for drug offenses by way of a really basic example in Chittenden County, which is where I um, spent most of uh, my years as a public defender in Vermont, um, the state's attorney decided that she was no longer, her office was no longer going to prosecute, for example, possession, unlawful possession of buprenorphine. Um, and so, you know, she advised the police departments in Chittenden County not to arrest people for possession of buprenorphine. And eventually that actually became a state policy. So, um, but that's just a really basic example that depending on what county you were in, you mm -hmm. might be arrested for possession of buprenorphine or you might not. Um, and I think the same is true for, um, you know, really small, uh, low level possession amounts of other drugs that are still unlawful in Vermont. I think some um, states attorneys have, I'll say, deprioritized arrests for low level drug possession. Um, in terms of who's being arrested, um, I mean, from your experience, obviously you were a public defender, so you were representing um, uh, people who are indigent, but um, did you get a sense from being in the courts who's being subject to these types of low-level uh, drug offenses primarily? Um, are, are you able to characterize it in any way? Well, as you know, you know, my experience is informed by the fact that I was a public defender. So I was representing people who qualified for court appointed counsel, meaning they, you know, their income level fell below a certain um, rate. Um, so, in, you know, in my experience, uh, a lot of poor people <laughs> were being arrested for these types of offenses. Uh, what I'll, what I'll say gen generally, I mean, I, you know, I also can think of some, um, stories about, and again, you know, when I talk about who was getting arrested for drug offenses, um, I, I, we can't, you know, detach that these, many of these people were also, were drug users, right? And that's why they were possessing drugs or distributing drugs or sharing drugs um, that, you know, that might lead to their arrest. And I think that um, certainly most of the folks that I was representing were indigent, but I'm sorry, I have like a little fly um, who just decided to arrive right now. Um, most of the people that I was representing, you know, that I saw being charged with these offenses were poor, but I can also think of some prominent, um, you know, newsworthy or newsworthy to me, newsworthy, to, to, you know, to, in some spaces in Vermont, um, people who were being who were drug users who got charged with drug offenses who were not poor you know who came from families with resources but as we heard um our the prior panel talking about you know the messaging that we've that so many of us have received for so long whether we are family members of a drug user or prosecutors or judges or um public defenders representing people charged with drug offenses is this sort of tough love, um, you know, like they need to hit rock bottom messaging, right? And so, you know, folks who came from families with resources to, you know, to try to support them and get them the treatment that they needed, um, but who were also led to believe that tough love was the way to go. And, um, you know, uh, I mean, I, we saw those people, I've, I've certainly seen those people as well, but, and the last note that I'll, I'll add when you ask about sort of who was being charged, um, is that I would remiss if I didn't say that in Vermont, we have, um, you mentioned that I'm on a panel and adv uh, an advisory panel to the legislature, uh, to try to address the disparities, the racial disparities in our criminal and juvenile legal systems in this state. Um, and what that, what we mean when we say that is that, uh, you know, the 
percentage of the population of Vermont that is Black or Brown or Indigenous is very small. Um, and like, let's say less than 2%, right? Um, and the uh, percentage of Black, Brown, and Indigenous people who are incarcerated in Vermont um, or due to convictions in Vermont, some of them are housed in a prison in Mississippi, um, the percentage of Black and Brown and Indigenous folks that we incarcerate for uh, convictions in Vermont uh, is disproportional to their representation in our population. So uh, just talking about Black people, for instance, um, we, Vermont, uh, regularly, the percentage of our incarcerated population in Vermont that is Black is steadily around 10%. Um, and the population of Black people in, in the state is below 2%. So, um, and I think that that those disproportionate numbers apply to like every metric when you when we're talking about the criminal legal system. So we, you know, prosecute more black people percentage wise, right? We um, incarcerate percentage wise, a higher uh, black people at a higher rate. We um, and I think that that extends to drug offenses too, right? That we arrest and prosecute uh, at a disproportionate rate, black, brown, black and brown people in Vermont for um, drug offenses as well. And I think that was really well documented. I think what you're referring to is the Council of State Governments report from 2022, um, or I, I imagine some of the data that you're, you're referencing is from that, um, which really gave a stark picture of the state in terms of Black people being represented, uh, uh, more likely to be convicted in misdemeanor cases, more likely to be represented um, in all corrections populations, um, and more likely to be incarcerated for both misdemeanors and felonies more than similarly situated white people. I think it's pretty stark results um, and uh, definitely something that I, I know the state has looked at in a fair amount, but um, a lot of the discourse has been focused on, uh, as far as I can tell, on, on changing the thresholds, changing the thresholds to try to address that between misdemeanors and felonies. Um, in, in your discussions and sort of the, the legislative discussions, you know, how much of the discourse is really getting at some of the issues that the previous panel really talked about? You know, how can we get away from this carceral approach in the first place with people that use drugs? And how much can we shift the entire framework for the system to get more of these cases out of the system entirely? So, you know, the idea of changing the threshold, right? So that uh, an amount that currently, a, a possession of an amount of drugs that currently would result in someone being charged with a felony would maybe be changed to only being a misdemeanor, right? But we've just discussed that, um, for example, you know, that's still problematic uh, in many ways, right? Including that um, Black and Brown people in Vermont are disproportionately prosecuted for misdemeanors and convicted and sentenced to jail, right? So um, I am, like the earlier panel, uh, definitely among the people who believe that we have to entirely separate the problem, the medical issue of substance use disorder from our criminal legal system, period, right? So we, sh uh, you know, sure, we could, we could change the threshold so that felony drug possession is now misdemeanor drug possession, or we could not criminalize drug possession, period, right? We could um, talk about what the root causes are, for substance use disorder, um, and frankly, for drug distrib distribution, if you are not someone with substance use disorder, right? Like if you are not actually chemically addicted to drug using drugs, maybe use drugs um, more uh, sort of socially or, you know, like in, in a party sense, I, I suppose, um, but you are use, uh, selling drugs, distributing drugs, right? Um, not every person who distributes drugs is ne necessarily has substance use disorder. Many do. Um, but I mean, I think that the, the you know, 
substance use disorder is a medical issue, right? So for that reason, it should be completely separated from our criminal legal system. As someone um, brilliantly put it on the earlier panel, like, why would we leave medical decisions to our judges and prosecutors and departments of corrections as opposed to medical doctors, right? And then, you know, what might drive someone to distribute drugs who is not themselves necessarily um, chemically addicted is often poverty, right? So when I talk about um, not focusing on things like changing the thresholds, but rather completely separating um, drug use, drug possession, even drug distribution from the criminal legal system, I'm talking about getting to the roots of treating people's medical health, right? And also um, solving poverty, um, meeting people's needs in this country, in this state and in this country, so that they are not driven by desperation to crime, um, and also meeting people's health needs so that if they have, for example, substance use disorder, they have access to treatment. Like I envision a world, I envision certainly for the state of Vermont, I think that this is very possible. I envision a world in which the the immense resources that we put into um, law enforcement are p- from police departments to you know pr- probation and parole offices to jails, that we put those resources into creating much more robust treatment services in our communities for people who are drug users. And I really want to come back to that conversation because it's a really important one in terms of breaking down, I think, a little bit more for people what resources we do pour into the criminal legal system. I, I don't think people realize completely how much goes into prosecuting a, a, a single case, you know, in, in the courts, how many people are involved in that process, how much resources it really takes. But uh, but I want to go back to sort of what you, you really talked powerfully about and what our previous panelists really got into very powerfully. And that is this idea that I think a lot of people have that, Somehow, by putting people into the criminal legal system, they're going to get access to some sort of treatment. They're going to get access to some sort of help. Um, But I think there's a a lack of understanding, like critical understanding of how the system really works and how it impacts people's lives. And uh, you and I have had uh, a couple of conversations about this in advance of today's um, discussion. Uh, you know, both of us, I worked as a public defender for over uh, 10 years, um, not in Vermont, but in in the District of Columbia primarily. And uh, we've compared notes on some of the different systemic things. But a lot of things are just really similar in terms of how people are brought into the system and how it impacts their 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 lives uh, just being prosecuted and and just sort of the way the system is set up. Um, ha- has all these very powerful impacts on people's lives. So I was wondering if you can sort of give people a little bit more context for how much goes into, you know, what happens? I mean, a person's in a holding cell, they're they're moved, you know, to court. Sometimes they're asked to come back to court. And, and, and how much does that really consume of a person's life, even if they're released? Sure. So um if when a person gets arrested, um, they uh, might, um, you know, most likely they'll go to the police department, at least for some period of time, um, even if they're going to be released, maybe they're released with a citation to come to court, you know, a month in the future, or maybe they're held until they go in front of a judge that day or the next day. Um, If it's the next day, they're going to go to jail, right? Um, for someone who is uh, released, not held for, you know, for uh, while their case is pending. Um, I mean, you you asked about sort of all the resources. When I start to think about it, the numbers of people involved grow really quickly, right? So there's engagement with the police department. Um, then there's, 
engagement with the court, we start to think about like the court clerks who are processing the new case. Well, actually, before it even gets there, we're thinking about the prosecutor's office, right? So the prosecutor staff um, of, you know, administrative staff and lawyers who um, process new cases as they come in. And then the court does the same thing. Um, you know, in Vermont, in Chittenden County, like my office would start to get involved when that person appear has their first appearance in court, whether that's, you know, on a date in the future for which they were cited to come to court or if they're in custody, you know, that first appearance in front of the judge, um, then we have to process that case and assign it to a lawyer. Um, and that person is, you know, a felony case is obviously going to take is, is probably going to take longer to resolve than a misdemeanor case. But even a misdemeanor case might take, let's say, at its, you know, uh, well, a misdemeanor case that went to trial could take, you know, a, at least six months. Um, and that's six months of that person coming to court, you know, probably at least once a month, um, meeting with their lawyer. Um, and if and if a case eventually goes to trial, when you when you add trial into the mix, you think about the, all the jurors that are being brought in um, and all their time. Um, so, you know, being arrested. I mean, this will not surprise anyone, but being arrested um, has an extreme impact on people's lives. Um, even if someone, you know, in if someone just gets cited and isn't even maybe brought to the police department, like that's best case scenario. But like most people are going to be brought to the police department. Maybe they're held overnight. Maybe they're held while their case is pending the entire time. But even being in jail overnight, like who's going to pick up your kids? Like who's going to tell your boss why you're late for work? Like who's going to tell anyone in your life where you are? Like, um, so there's like sort of the immediate impact. And then there's the lasting impact too. There's the stigma of being in trouble with the law, even if eventually your case gets like you got acquitted, let's say, or your case gets dismissed um, or you, you know, your case gets resolved for um, what's perceived as a much less serious offense than what you maybe originally were charged with. I was thinking um, after one of our conversations about like, you know, even when um, people are acquitted or their charges are dismissed and maybe their um, their court documents are sealed or their cases expunged, right, their convictions expunged, I was thinking about, well, what about Google? Like, what if, you know, a potential employer, you know, is just does an internet search? Like, are news stories scrubbed from the internet? Probably not, right? So, um there's a real lasting impact. And I think particularly in my experience as a public defender, I'm not going to say that this, there was an intentionality to it, but I think that there certainly um, were subconscious biases that manifested in judges and prosecutors thinking that there was less of an impact on poor people to being involved in the criminal legal system than there might be for wealthier people, like a sort of an assumption or like that poor people didn't have jobs or poor people didn't have family responsibilities or that being in jail, frankly, wasn't going to be as bad for them, especially, you know, especially, in, um, especially if someone had been involved with the criminal legal system before, right? Um, and all of that is patently not true, right? Um, the impacts of going to jail are terrible on everybody who goes to jail. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of working poor in the state of Vermont and in our country, and um, the impact is just as bad, regardless of what your sort of wealth or social status is. Um, and, you know, and what we're here to talk about today is also to add into that mix that you're a drug user, that you have a substance use disorder, right? So in Vermont, um, and, you know, this was spoken about on the earlier panel as well, in Vermont, um, people with substance use disorder who end up in jail can get medically assisted treatment while they are in jail. Um, and I am um, 
I, I'm about to use the word glad. I mean, I, I would rather they be able to get it than the, that they not be able to get it, right? Like, you know, to to have someone in jail withdrawing from, um, you know, withdrawing from drugs um, is both cruel and dangerous. So I am, um, I would rather that they be able to get that medically assisted treatment in jail than not. However, I think it is shameful and an embarrassment that our that the uh, that we are using our jails as treatment facilities, essentially, right? Um, and you know, this goes back to my earlier comment about diverting those resources to actually have robust treatment for people in our communities uh, as opposed to our jails. Um, so, yeah. I guess I'll stop for a second and let you jump in. No, I mean, there's so much that you said there that's really important. And I, I, I wish we could drill down a whole lot more on, on some of that. Um, I will, I, I do want to go back to sort of the, the impacts of arrests, because I think a lot of people talk, think, well, maybe, uh, you know, a case is going to be diverted after it goes to the court system, or maybe, you know, eventually even if there's a conviction, we'll, we have record clearing laws that, that will allow you to go back and, and get that off, off the record eventually. Um, but, but I think you raised a lot of really important points. I mean, even just the, the mugshot issue, even just the information about people's information being, being made public initially that never really gets off the internet. The, 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 the fact that, you know, when people are, you know, pre-trial, and you talked about having to go to court, you know, many times over over a period of months, maybe six months or something to get to trial, um, which involves, you know, going to these status conferences on a, on a regular basis where you spend half a day or more, you know, in court. Or um, if you're lucky, you might spend you, you might be able to make that appearance, you know, post covid um, on Zoom or something. But. But not everybody has the access to, real, you know, be able to the, the ability to really take off a whole bunch of time during their day and sit and wait for their case to be called um, in court or even out of court. So you have like you have really tremendous impacts on people who have the least resources um, who might be their housing situation might be affected by the fact that they now have a pending court case. They may be applying for jobs where something comes up in a background check. Um, all of those issues, I think, are just incredibly uh, unrecognized sometimes by the criminal legal system. And I think you put it incredibly well in sort of saying that I think that there is, I don't want to paraphrase, but, um, you know, there's this assumption that there are fewer impacts on people's lives if they, they happen to, to, to have fewer resources. Um, and the reverse really seems to be the case. Right. It's really expensive to be poor in the United States. Um, and uh, uh, as you were talking, I was thinking, you know, the punishment for for being even charged with a crime, right, before you're even convicted, the punishment starts right away, right? The penalties include, like, that you do have to come to court, like, over and over and over and maybe jeopardize your job if you have one. And, um, you know, and again, we're, you know, this, this webinar today is focused specifically on people charged with drug offenses, many of whom are drug users, and which, you know, all on its own has its own stigma. Um, but then, and I think that um, Morgan talked about this on the earlier panel, you know, a conviction for a drug offense, um, if you are in any kind of profession that requires licensing, or if you are someone who receives any sort of government benefits, um, like related to housing or related to school, um, you can lose all of that, right? Um, so there you know, the, the punishment starts right away um, with the stigma of your arrest, the, you know, potential impact on your family, um, your housing, your job um, of your arrest of, you know, having to take. Um, so in Vermont, we um, in the county that I practiced in, we had status conferences, weekly status conferences called calendar calls and um 
this was pre-COVID and I um, I left that position during, you know, sort of the peak of COVID or after the first year of COVID. So I don't know how, how sort of how hybrid the court is still proceeding these days. Um, I hope maybe they uh, continued some practices that made it, you know, that developed during the peak of the pandemic that ma- frankly made it easier for people in terms of not having to appear in court in person as much. But back during the um, pre-COVID days, you know, uh, calendar call was every week and it was, the hearing notice would tell someone that it was scheduled for one o'clock and that it would be a five minute hearing. But what that really meant was that all, let's say 60 people who were scheduled for calendar calls that day all had to be there at one o'clock. And, you know, they, they would all, you know, maybe I would have five or six clients who had calendar call that day and I would meet with them. And then I would go into the courtroom and wait my turn, you know, behind whatever, whichever lawyers got in there before me. And then when it was my turn, I would call up each of those clients. So a client who arrived at one o'clock could easily be there until four o'clock. Um, so that's a half a day of work, right? So, and if every month you have to tell your boss that you have to take a half a day to go to court, um, how long is your boss gonna keep you on? Um, so there are penalties that come with um, being arrested for a crime that start, you know, from that the moment of arrest and go through conviction. Um, there are collateral consequences, um, like we've talked about specifically related to drug offenses. You know, collateral consequences can include, um, you know, licensing and benefits and things like that. Um, I just lost my train of thought, but. That's okay. We so, have so much that we can cover today. <laughs> okay, uh, good. In, in probably the next 10, 15 minutes. We'll do our best, but um, okay. I think you you you've said so much that's really important here. Um, you know, we just want to talk big picture in terms of the system. Uh, the criminal legal system is 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 not set up as a provider of treatment. You know, it's not it that's not its fundamental purpose. That's not the way our U.S. system uh, of uh, criminal law is really set up in in, in any place. And and you and I, you know, like we've been trained. I think lawyers are trained that you know, we're supposed to be client centered. And so we make, we help clients make the decisions that are going to be the, the, the ones that they want, the outcomes that they want, not necessarily, you know, the system isn't set up to be sort of a best interest focused or, or, or our role is not necessarily, you know, to look out just to, to try and figure out the, the best thing for the client in the big picture. And it's an adversarial system. It's an adversarial system at its core. And that's the way judges and prosecutors and the system kind of has to work in most in most ways, most times. And I, I guess just reflecting on that, does it make any sense that 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 we are trying to to use that system uh, to try and facilitate treatment? Because it seems like the natural inclination is to sort of do the things that Morgan talked about, is just sort of exert influence over people in a coercive way. Um, am I, yeah, I was just that in a, in a coherent way. Yeah, no, I was also reflecting back on, uh, something Morgan talked about. She talked about being arrested repeatedly, right? Like once the police kind of identified her as a drug user, um, they repeatedly like harassed and arrested her because they knew that they could, that they would usually find drugs on her or drugs in her car or whatever. And I have absolutely seen that in practice in Vermont. Um, whether it's a drug user or a person with mental illness who is repeatedly arrested by the police. And I, and I want to say this, you know, the police and the prosecutors have outside pressures that they deal with as well, right? Like I am certain that there is a contingent of business owners in Burlington who, um, you know, put a lot of pressure on the police to, deal, you know, to, 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 on the police to deal with the unhoused population, to deal with the drug user population, right? And like, I'm, there are probably many police officers who are tired of being called on to intervene um, when the problem, you know, 
the root problems are not being addressed. Why are the unhoused people unhoused? You know, why aren't the dr- the drug users getting treatment? So, you know, we can continue to use our criminal legal system to repeatedly arrest the same people over and over. But to me, all that demonstrates is that uh, that response doesn't work, right? Um, you know, I mentioned earlier that I'm a big, you know, I'm like a broken record. I'm a big, whenever I talk about these issues, I say Mm -hmm. that the way to reduce crime and to make communities safer is to make sure that we're meeting the needs of all the people in our communities. So if that's, you know, including um, providing community-based medical treatment for people with substance use disorder, um, rather than repeatedly arresting them and putting them in jail where um, they're not going to get therapeutic, the therapeutic treatment that they might need if they are inclined to to, to try therapeutic treatment. Um, they're certainly not going to get that in jail. Um, they uh, will frankly also have access to drugs in jail. And um, as you know, has been noted, I think on the earlier panel, um, they then face or there is heightened risk of overdose in jail and upon release from jail. So, um, you know, I my message is um, always that if um, if putting people in jail really made communities safer, the United States would be the safest country in the world. It is not, um, you know, when we're talking about arresting and criminalizing people for medical conditions, um, jail's never going to work. Jail's never going to solve the problem. um, And we should stop doing it. (laughs) And, you know, and uh, we should we need to stop criminalizing people with substance use disorder and really need to divorce um, our response to the problem of addiction and, you know, drug distribution um, as it relates to drug users from the criminal legal system. And frankly, I would think that our court system and our, you know, Department of Corrections, our law enforcement systems would appreciate not being called on to be the, to, to be the responders to um, people in, in a medical crisis or people in a mental health crisis um, because they're not trained to do that. Right. And we've, we have become dependent on asking them to do that and it, they're not trained to do it. It shouldn't be their jobs. Um, And it's certainly not having those people serve those roles is certainly not fixing any of the problems. And we know at the same time, and I think this is something that Dr. Wakeman talked about, our previous panelists talked about, that there are better ways to connect people to supports. Um, There are, you know, the use of overdose prevention centers as not only a way to help keep people alive, uh, but but also to connect with them in a human way, to connect with people that that are um, maybe experiencing more significant use um, in, in a more meaningful way and, and build trust and build support in a way that the criminal legal system does not. The use of cr- uh, community responders, community response teams, teams to be out in, in, in the field, you know, working with people to provide housing supports that are meaningful, that, that give people stability. We know those things are successful. Like you said, we know those are the way to go. And yet we still continue to spend the resources that we have on the system. I, I know we're we're getting close to our time here. So I I did want to ask you one more, one more question, if I could, um, that's I think specific to, to Vermont or or uh, a few states. And that is this idea that uh, there are people who come into the criminal legal system in Vermont who maybe before the court and for whatever reason or another, there is an indication that they will not be subject to jail time as a, mm. as a result and can can be exposed to a criminal conviction without ever having been appointed a lawyer. I find that 
um, deeply concerning. Um, but I, I wondered if you could explain that for us real quick. Sure. And I, I, you, I think this varies from county to county sure. in Vermont. Um, not the legalities of it, but whether sort of like what the practice is around this issue. But what you're talking about is that um, constitutionally, someone's only entitled to a court appointed lawyer if their liberty is at stake. So if someone is charged with an offense, and um, and I can illustrate this a little bit better talking about New Hampshire. When I practiced in New Hampshire, um, the way that misdemeanor offenses are categorized is that there are class A misdemeanors and class B misdemeanors. Class A misdemeanors carried a potential penalty of up to a year in jail. Class B misdemeanors were lower level offenses and can only be penalized by a fine. So it was fairly common that someone might be arrested and charged with a class A misdemeanor. And then when they showed up to court, the prosecutor would reduce it to a class B misdemeanor, meaning that the person was only facing a fine. And so the person would no longer be entitled to apply for a court appointed lawyer. Um, so similarly in Vermont, if we don't necessarily categorize misdemeanors that way, but if a prosecutor says in court on the record in front of the judge, the offer in this case is fine only, right? Um, I'm, you know, I'm not going to be, if this person pleads guilty, I'm not going to, or is convicted, I'm not going to ask for them to go to jail. Then the judge can say, okay, well, then you're not, um, your liberty is not at stake. So you're not entitled to court appointed counsel. Um, so that leaves a person to either hire private counsel if they can afford it or not have a lawyer at all. And the concern about this, especially in the context of this discussion about drug cases, is I've alluded to the fact that um, drug convictions, um, you know, many different types of convictions can have an impact on um, things like jobs and licensing and things like that. But like drug convictions in particular can also have an impact on benefits like housing benefits or, you know, school benefits. Um, and so if someone is pleading guilty to, you um, a drug offense in particular, uh, without the advice of counsel, uh, uh, like, there's no way, I will just say, there's no way that they're going to fully understand the potential impact of that decision. Um, a judge can't be their lawyer. The prosecutor is also not their lawyer. So while the judge may explain certain things during the hearing or during the proceeding, the judge can't give the person advice the same way that a court, you know, a lawyer for that person could give them. And in my experience um, of 20 years of explaining to people sort of what their constitutional rights are and what the impacts are of pleading guilty or going to trial, you know, or, uh, you know, the potential impacts of a conviction are, it's complicated. It's not, you know, lawyers are trained to understand the legal language. Non-lawyers are not trained to understand the legal language. And frankly, it's um, a, a travesty, I don't think it's too strong a word, to put people in a situation where they um, are like, are not going to be fully understanding what they're agreeing to um, and the potential impacts of a conviction um, on there. We haven't even talked about like immigration, right? Like there's all kinds of what we call in legal language, collateral consequences to convictions. Um, and, you know, there's just no circumstance whether there's liberty at stake or not that I think that anyone should be um, put in the position of uh making decisions about how to proceed in a criminal case without the advice of counsel. It's an incredibly troubling concept, but um, uh, thanks so much for explaining it to us. And I think we're we're really running up against the, the end of this segment in terms of time. I just want to say thank you so much. I, I, we've packed a lot in. I feel like this conversation could go uh, double the amount of time and still not cover everything we really want to cover. Um, but we really appreciate you spending the time with us today. We appreciate the work that you're doing and, and your colleagues at the Center for Justice Reform. Um, and we look forward to additional conversations, hopefully in the future. Um, thank, thanks so much, Jessica. You're very welcome. welcome. Thanks so much for inviting me. And I would definitely um, 
I hope we have many more collaborations in the future. So thanks. We, we look forward to it. All right. Take care. Um, everyone, we're, we're going to take a quick break before our next panel. Uh, we, we've, as you can tell, tried to pack a lot into today's event. Uh, we really appreciate those of you who are sticking with us uh, for the entire event. We have one more panel coming up. Um, and uh, we're going to take about a nine minute break, 10 minute break uh, before we get to that. Um, and while we do that, we're going to we're going to play a short video about overdose oh. prevention centers, um, a video that features some of the great work uh, and the staff at On Point NYC, which, as many of you know, opened the first two OPCs in the U.S. last year. They've already reversed over eleven hundred overdoses that could have turned fatal without their incredible work, their incredible interventions. Um, if you need to step away, we'll put the link in the chat for you to check it out later. Um, but thank you again for being here today and for sticking with us. And we'll be back at 1 p.m. for our final panel that discusses uh, reforms in practice around the globe. See you soon. Hey, right, we're back. Thanks again, everyone, for sticking with us. Um, we're gonna try and get uh, everyone connected here in just a minute. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and get this panel started and, and start doing the introductions of our panelists. Um, th this, this panel, this next segment Fine. is uh, uh, what reforms have intended to focus more on where things uh, are happening. What reforms have actually been enacted around the world, in, in places, where things are happening, and, we've been able and, to and how we got there some in, really in, interesting in those places. Speakers. And we've been able to um, bring together some really interesting speakers different perspectives um, who uh, have this discussion, who also bring um, different perspectives uh, to this discussion. Um, Neve Eastwood is the executive director for Release, um, the, which is the National Center of Expertise on Drugs and Drug Laws in the UK. Uh, Neve is a member of the expert steering group for the Global Dr Drug Survey and has been a technical advisor to the Global Commission on Drug Policy and has several research roles uh, and university roles as well. So her bio is in the chat. Uh, we really appreciate Neve being here uh, uh, and, and giving us perspective from all over the world. Um, Corey Davis serves as the director of the Network for Public Health Laws Harm Reduction Legal Project and is an adjunct assistant professor at the NYU Grossman School of Medicine. Corey was previously a senior attorney at the National Health Laws, sorry, National Health Law Program, and has served as an employment rights attorney in the past in Pennsylvania, and has authored several recent studies assessing the impacts of decriminalization of low-level drug possession in Oregon. And finally, Kennedy Stewart uh, is an associate professor at the Simon Fraser University's School of Public Policy and director of the SFU Center for Public Policy Research. He's a, a former member of parliament uh, in Canada uh, from 2011 to 2018 and the, served as the, was it the 40th mayor of Vancouver uh, from 2018 to 2022. He's also authored a, a book explaining the process of getting to uh, the decriminalization exemption in British Columbia entitled Decrim, How We Decriminalize Drugs in British Columbia. Um, thank you as well for being here, all of you. Uh, it's really nice of you to take the time to do this. Uh, we're gonna try to get into um, a, a number of different questions here, but I think what we, before we really get at sort of the landscape of what's going on around the world, I uh, wanted to, to just uh, talk with you a little bit about um, some of the things that really came up in the previous panels about why these reforms are so important and, and why you think that countries are moving in this direction, why more countries are starting to rethink the notion that we've you know, accepted for so many decades that there's something inherently criminal about possessing and, and, and using drugs. Um, I think it, until we get Neve back, I'm gonna uh, just go ahead and, and ask you, um, Corey, you've, uh, you've tracked and you've written about legal reforms that are intended to, to reduce overdose in particular. And I know you've written about collateral consequences as well. I think you've, your, your article is Collateral Consequences on Criminalizing Substance Use Disorder. 
Um, what is it about criminal laws that sort of creates the biggest obstacles to getting more people connected to harm reduction services, treatment, and, and other services? I know some of the folks previously talked about this, but can you summarize just a little bit of that? Sure, oh, great. I would say thanks again for uh, inviting me to this, <laughs> this great meeting. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that it's actually been really well covered by the previous panelists. Um, but uh, I, I think that the main you know, barrier here is, is the criminalization itself, right? I mean, uh, when you tell people the thing that you are doing is literally illegal. Um, and if we find out that you're doing it, we're going to you know, bring the power of the state down on you in all kinds of ways, um, not only through, I and mean, we've been talking a lot about, you know, the actual process of being run through the criminal legal system, but, but of course there are all kinds of, we say, collateral consequences, you know, both formal and informal. Uh, your employer might just take it on themselves, not to, or a potential employer, not to hire you, an existing employer might fire you, the state might, you know, attempt to or even take away your children, you might lose your housing, um, you know, there are all kinds of things. Um, you know, we are, I think, as other folks have also kind of mentioned, the United States is a very oppressive country. I mean, we rely extremely heavily on an oppressive, um, you know, justice state. We incarcerate people at a much higher rate than almost any other country, and we keep them in jail for much longer. And we permit, and in a lot of cases, actually require um, these, you know, that the uh, these called collateral consequences follow people sometimes throughout their lives. And people know that, right? I mean, this is by design. The system is designed. Um, to pull you in and, and make it very difficult for you to get out. So in that context, you know, why would I bring myself to the attention of the authorities um, and say, look, I am a, I am a criminal um, and I, you know, I'm opening myself up to this whole parade of terrible things um, happening to me. And, you know, we see that in all kinds of ways. I mean, you know, one of the more acute examples is, of course, in the context of, of overdose, right? someone is on the scene of an overdose, um, or they themselves, you know, have experienced an overdose and medical care is, is needed or warranted. You know, that care is most of the time provided by, by the state or at least coordinated by the state. You call 911 and um, oftentimes not only does an ambulance, you know, come, but the police come. And people know that. And we also know, you know, from empirical data and folks who are using drugs know from their own experience that oftentimes those police officers, by disposition, by training, sometimes by departmental policy, um, they don't care that you're trying to do the same thing. They don't care that arresting you might result in, you know, your, uh, you know, future harm. Um, you know, it's somebody else's problem, you know, their job is to you know detect crime and arrest criminals and, and that's what they do and, and people understand that so you know just in in the myriad of ways you know criminalization of people who use drugs just is designed you know is designed to cause harm to those people i mean that is the point of the criminal legal system or one of the points right is deterrence um you know we want people to think like I shouldn't do this bad thing because it's going to, you know, it's going to make my life difficult. It's going to be bad for me. Like the system is literally designed to do that. Uh, but when you apply that to drug use, you know, you find people don't want to be involved in that system and, and that has all kinds of negative knocks. Thanks, Corey. Uh, Kennedy, I, I, I guess I'll turn to you next um, to sort of pick up where Corey left off. And Neve, we were just talking, hopefully your sound works now, but we were just talking about sort of just the reasons that countries, that more places are starting to get their arms around this idea that uh, decriminalization is a better approach. And so mm -hmm. the reasons, the harms that that sort of have driven that conversation, I'm going to turn to you in just a second, but uh, Kennedy Stewart, if you could just sort of give us a, a quick snapshot. I know that when uh, the overdose crisis has been severe in uh, Vancouver, particularly in, in BC generally. Um, and one of the primary reasons for the granting of the exemption really was the just incredible crisis that, that you all were facing at 
And I, I think it's very much in line with what the Minister of Health and Addictions said at the time the, the exemption was granted. Um, and I, I don't know if we have that, but I was, I, I know that she said that we know criminalization drives people to use alone, given the increasingly <laughs> toxic, sorry. Um, I'm not going to read the entire statement, but the, the decriminalization is a vital step to getting people more connected to the services and supports. Um, is is that sort of like the, the central, one of the central issues that drove the decriminalization exemption in, in BC? Yeah, thanks uh, for having me as this morning or this afternoon where, where you are. And uh, thanks for putting us on it's such an important discussion. And I, I just wanted to say I'm coming to you from the unceded traditional territories of the uh, Musqueam, Squamish and Slavotooth people here in uh, in Vancouver. Um, you know what? Uh, when I came in as mayor in 2018, uh, what started to land in my inbox every Monday morning was uh, the death count, uh, essentially the number of people who died that the previous week of, of overdoses. Uh, but so I should say the toxic drugs and uh, and then the number of people that we had revived through our uh, fire rescue service. Uh, and the, it really what has driven decriminalization, I think, in British Columbia are the facts of the matter where, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we had one person a day dying here in the city, still uh, six people a day in British Columbia and then uh, anywhere from 20 to 25 a day in Canada. Uh, and when, when the chief coroner comes out and, and just reports these numbers, uh, you know, it takes a while to get your head around it. And then you realize like the massive toll that this is taking on families. And uh, it, so then you start to have, of course, the activism always starts at, at, the, at the local level. The drug using community uh, starts to take matters into their own hands. They're quickly uh, endorsed by uh, medical providers. Uh, and then politicians get super nervous because they, they realize that they ha they are uh, presiding over a massive policy failure. Um, and then, but the key is always when the police get involved and say, we can't deal with this anymore. Uh, there's, there's, you know, our members are uh, facing mental health crisis themselves. Uh, they're, they, they don't know what to do when they arrive on scene. They're, uh, they, they're, they're arresting people and for no reason, they, there's no, so, you know, it's the system breaks down essentially, and then uh, eventually, as politicians are supposed to do, uh, you get um, you know new policy solutions. But really, only after the level of tragedy becomes so apparent. Thanks so much, Neve. Um, I wanted to go back to to you on this question too, just because I think, like, particularly the Portugal example, uh, people talk about a lot as being sort of health uh, crisis driven in terms of the impetus for change. Um, can you describe that just a little bit? And, and is that sort of reflected elsewhere in the world? So firstly, apology for the technical problems. I'm afraid my computer didn't like Zoom, so I've had to move to my laptop. Um, I, I think you know, the, the situation in Portugal, and as many people on this webinar will know, Portugal decriminalized possession of all drugs back in 2001 and, and very reflective of what Kennedy has just said this idea of crisis so Portugal had a very high level of uh, problematic drug use there was a high incidence of public drug use it was ubiquitous across society so it was affecting every family um, and really what they did was bring together experts to work out what's the solution here how can we make sure that we provide an environment where people can seek the support that they need. Um, and those experts uh, drove um, a, a body of research, which really evidenced that we need to have investment in treatment, investment in harm reduction. Harm reduction is a key component of the Portuguese drug strategy, as is prevention. Um, but key to all of those is decriminalization, that none of these interventions will be as successful as they can be without a decriminalized model, without ensuring that people are treated as humans and, and people, first of all, rather than criminals. And I think that's a really important point to get across, that when you treat people as criminals first and foremost, they won't want to come and get the support they need. So I think that was very much the, the situation in Portugal. It was also a really um, 
very much like Canada and, and many of the US states or all of the US states, very much a, a, a priority for the public in terms of uh, politicians getting uh, behind this issue, trying to look to solutions. Um, so definitely in Portugal, the driver was crisis. I think in other countries across the world, Portugal's often held out as the only country that's decriminalized. That's not the case. There are dozens of countries that have ended criminal sanctions for possession of all drugs, not just cannabis. Um, and, and for many of those countries, it was from a human rights based approach. So countries like Germany, uh, Spain, Italy, uh, all have ended criminal sanctions for possession through their constitutional courts in recognition of bodily autonomy, of the need for privacy, of the fact that the use of the criminal law to try and deter this um, activity, which we know it doesn't, and we know that it causes more harm than good, um, is interfering in people's private lives. And I think, you know, we've talked a lot today about a problematic use of like drug dependency but we also have to remember that there's the majority of people who use drugs do so without any harm to themselves uh, the harms that they face are the harms of an unregulated market and of criminalization and so the other group of people that we are over criminalizing are young people and we are therefore disadvantaged in them in the way that jessica described about the impact of um, criminal records on life opportunities. And so very much that, again, has been one of the drivers that we've seen in other jurisdictions for decriminalization. Mm -hmm. And just finally, I would say that the more recent examples of decriminalization have come about as a result of the evidence, the evidence that criminalization doesn't deter use, the evidence that criminalization is actively preventing people from seeking support when they need it. And so one piece of research that I think is really helpful is um, one that was released uh, about a year ago in the UK from the Higher Education Policy Institute that reported that nearly one in five students who had a scary experience with drugs did not seek emergency help for fear of punishment. And I think for any parent, you know, we talk about how the drug laws are there to protect children. They are actively doing the opposite and that any parent would want to make sure that there is a legal system in place that enhances people's access to help, access to health um, and, and respects human rights. I, I think that's incredibly, uh, an incredibly powerful point. I, I wanted to also ask you, Neve. Um, there was a report that was put out by uh, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, the UN. Um, it was put out in, I think, September. Um, and there, there seem to be some pretty direct, powerful statements that, that track some of the things that you just uh, told us. Um, I don't know if we have that uh, one of the statements, but um, the, the High Commissioner Volker Turk had had said, you know, that that laws and practices deployed to address drug use must not end up exacerbating human suffering, that treating people who use drugs as criminals is not the solution. Um, I mean, do you see that as a significant shift in the way that um, the international community is looking at these issues? And, and do, do you think that the general uh, advocacy community throughout the world sees that as a as a significant shift. Now, I, I think the United Nations has been on a journey in this policy area. Um, we just have to look to, back to 1999 when, led by Kofi Annan as General Secretary, they, they declared a drug-free world in 10 years. We can do it. Um, I think we can all agree that that was an utter failure. Um, but we have seen UN bodies call for reform of drug laws previously. And in fact, um, the International Narcotic Control Board, which are the, the, the sort of the arbiters of the um, international treaties, had criticized Portugal back in the early noughties for taking this approach. Roll forward 20 years. Now, not only do we have the statement from the Office of the Commission on Human Rights, but we also have the whole UN family coming together and saying through the chief executive board, which represents all 33 agencies, that countries, that member states should end criminal sanctions for possession offences, that they should end the criminalisation of people who use drugs. 
and end it because it also leads to the over-policing of racialized communities. So I think this is just an extension of that position that has been taken by the um, Office of the, the, the uh, Commissioner of Human Rights by the Commissioner. Um, and I think it's really important that we remember the UN is now calling on member states to implement decriminalization policies, that this now fits within the framing of the international frame, frame sorry, international drug treaties. And when you say, you know, calling on member states, it seems like that statement was pretty direct. I mean, that's yeah. a pretty, pretty clear statement. I don't, I don't think I read the, the entire statement, but, you know, they actually said that states should move away from the, the policies um, uh, that, that uh, states should move away from the current dominant focus on prohibition um and repression and punishment and embrace laws and policies anchored in human rights and aimed at harm reduction like you said um it seemed like a really powerful statement and do you see that there's i mean do you see increasing momentum around the con- around the world do you feel yes, there is increasing momentum in other states Certainly, we're seeing a growing movement. Like when we first produced the report into, which I think has been shared, the Quiet Revolution, the first iteration of that was in 2012 when we identified 21 countries across the globe that had ended criminal sanctions. And as I said, for the all the majority of those countries had done it for all controlled substances. Um, and roll forward to 2016 when we produced the, the next version of the report, it had gone up to 30 countries. We now have an interactive uh, decriminalization map on our Talking Drugs website, which I can share in the chat. And that has 38 plus countries that have ended criminal sanctions. This is a growing movement. We see conversations in Ireland, conversations in Norway. South Africa has decriminalized cannabis. I mean, this is... Prohibition has been accepted, I think, globally as a failure. Unfortunately, what we have um, are many governments and many politicians continuing to use it as a political tool to look tough on crime. I mean, we need more politicians like Kennedy who come forward and say we need a health-based approach, we need to follow the evidence. So I think we're seeing the kind of last resistance to decriminalization. So I, I think in the next 10 years, we'll see far more countries come forward and start to end criminal sanctions. But as I said, I mean, this is a growing movement. The evidence is in the favor of decriminalization. We have to start treating people um, as human beings, first and foremost, and not as criminals. And and I think that goes back to what Cassandra mentioned at the very beginning of today's presentation was really just that we need to stop, you know, wishing and praying that something's going to change using the same policies and actually look at the evidence. And when you look at the evidence, like you just said, um, and and there's very positive results that come from decriminalization uh, efforts. Um, And that's what what I I really wanna emphasize here as part of the conversation. Um, I think all of you bring different aspects of this, but Corey, I'll turn to you next. You know, when when, uh, measure 110, the the ballot measure that uh, enacted decriminalization by a wide margin, by the way, in Oregon in 2020, um, when it uh, went into effect, it um, significantly reinvested a, a lot of taxpayer dollars into harm reduction and treatment services. I mean, may- maybe if you if you could just tell us a little bit about that that transition. It's obviously is something that takes a long time to implement and and to create these structures and to create the the grant funding that to invest all that. But what do you see in terms of the the results so far? Uh, not only in terms of building out uh, uh, harm reduction and treatment services and access to services, but also in terms of I know you studied overdose rates. So when we look at the data on benefits. Uh, what what do we know so far? Yeah, thanks, Gray. So, yeah, probably most of the folks on this call know the Oregon story, but just very briefly, um, there was a ballot initiative which are permitted in in some U.S. states where a um, <clears throat> question of of changing state laws put directly to the voters. 
Um, you get enough signatures, you can put the initiative on the ballot, and um, if the majority of folks, if, uh, voters in the state vote for it, it becomes law. So um, this was one of those initiatives called Measure 110, and it did a number of things, but the two main things that it did was um, first, it changed the possession. We say decriminalized, right? Which is a you know a term that has a wide variety of meanings. Meanings, but in this particular case, it moved possession of small amounts of all drugs from a misdemeanor, a crime that can be pub- punished with fines and jail time, created a new class of. Um, you know, infraction, um, where a person will still, you know, be detected and um, presented with a citation by a law enforcement officer. Um, But that citation is only punishable by a fine, not to exceed $100. And if the person um, attempts to access treatment or, you know, calls a hotline um, to get some treatment information that that fine is waived. And there are no other collateral consequences in the criminal legal system permitted associated with that citation. So that's part one. Part two, um, Oregon has legalized cannabis and generates a fair amount of money um, in taxes from the sale of cannabis. And it redirected some of that, actually a majority of that cannabis tax money into a variety of prevention, treatment, harm reduction initiatives. So it's kind of this, you know, two-legged stool. And it did a few other minor things, but those were the big ones. So we um, were one of the first groups to look at that empirically. And, um, you know, it's relatively new. So this happened in early 2021. So we're still in, in early days. Um, we wanted to look at two of the more easy to measure and obvious outcomes. So we wanted to see what happened with drug arrests uh, in Oregon, and we wanted to see what happens with fatal overdoses um, in Oregon. And, you know, unsurprisingly, we found that arrests fell substantially. Um, how substantially they fell depends a little bit on how you measure arrests um, due to just statistical quirks. Those tickets that folks are getting generally actually do show up in the state arrest data, and that's just a definitional issue. Um, So if you include those, they fell arrest for minor drug crimes fell by about 70%. If you exclude them, they fell by by more than that, Um, which is not surprising, right? That's we would be shocked if that didn't happen. The potentially more surprising thing that we found was in the first year after Measure 110 went into effect, we found no significant change in fatal drug overdoses in Oregon compared to what we would expect in the absence of Measure 110, right? So um, just to, to clarify that a little bit, overdoses, unfortunately, have been rising in most states in the United States for more than the past decade. So it's not that overdoses didn't continue to rise in Oregon, they did. Um, But unfortunately, overdoses continued to rise in in most other states in the United States. And we didn't see, um, you know, we didn't see a change in what we would have expected um, had Measure 110 not been enacted. Um, And if, if I could editorialize just for a second, I mean, as a, you know, as a research team, I had originally thought that it would be the, um, you know, the proponents of Measure 110 who would be very unhappy with that finding because, um, you know, a lot of those folks, I think very sincerely thought that Measure 110 would result in a reduction um, relative to trends in in overdose deaths. And, And unfortunately, again, in this first, you know, relatively brief time period, we didn't find that. Um, But in fact, what happened was that it was the opponents (laughs) of Measure 110 uh, who seemed very unhappy with that. And and they they kind of convinced themselves and everybody else, it seems, or a lot of other people, that Measure 110 was the cause of all of Oregon's ills. You know, there's been, uh, you know, uh, the perceived disorder and public homelessness and so on. They had sort of 
it just convinced themselves, um, or I mean, actually, you know, whatever, assuming good faith, you know, they, they actually thought that um, this was uh, measure 110 was the cause of all of these, all of the social disorders. So in fact, it was those groups that, that, you know, said, you know, you know, these, there must be some problem with the data or, you know, you're trying to, trying to discredit the research. Um, and I think that is, you know, really interesting from a political um, standpoint. So happy to talk more about that, but I want to let the, the other presenters and, and really, it goes back to the things that you know others have talked about throughout today in terms of you know the dangers in the in the toxic drug supply um, being the primary driver of overdose deaths, um, being the the driver of overdose dr deaths. Um, I, I want to go back to to Kennedy um, also on, on this topic because I, I know. Again, overdose has been a, a primary uh, discussion point in in Vancouver and in BC throughout Canada, and um, you know I think that you all have you all have worked hard to sort of implement. Um, I, I know that even Health Canada did reinvest some additional resources in uh, that are associated with the BC pilot. I mean, do you? I, I, I know that right now it's a challenging time because you're still in the first year of implementation, but do you feel like there is some momentum in terms of uh, how how the exemption is working? Yeah, I mean, um, not so much in the city of Vancouver. Uh, so, uh, you know, I won't go into all kinds of administrivia, but uh, the city of Vancouver has its own uh, police service. Uh, that that's been around for forever. Uh, and so they, you know, essentially the Vancouver police decided to decriminalize themselves. Like they were not arresting people for possession even before decriminalization happened. But outside of the city of Vancouver, uh, they have a whole bunch of different types of police forces, mainly the, R uh, the RCMP, which is a national force that contracts services to local communities. And they were fully implemented, fully you know, really uh, enforcing the drug laws. And so we think outside of Vancouver, you'll certainly see a, a, a drop in arrests. And and really the most important thing that kind of sold me on this was this drug seizures. So um, police, they may not arrest you, but, you know, if you think of an officer on the beat with not a ton of training, runs into somebody with a small amount of drugs, and the law says you have to arrest this person, they don't, but they usually seize the drugs uh, because they're, if you talk to officers, they're worried that if they don't and the person dies, they may be legally culpable for this, or if they, you know, and the other way around too. So it's safer for them to seize the drugs. And they needed some real guidance from legislators as to what we should do in these circumstances. And so I think that's why the police eventually, you know, the, the senior police services got behind this was because it gave certainty to officers as what to do. And, and that's, so I would, once we get our statistics back here, I don't expect that we'll have a, a huge drop in, in toxic drug deaths. And I never really thought we would. I thought if we were having 10 deaths a day, if it dropped down to nine or eight, that would be a, a spectacular result. Um, so we've been continuing to focus on other um other harm reduction measures, uh, mostly a safer supply, which is trying to, you know, prescribe alternatives to uh, to, to toxic street drugs. Uh, plus, we've legalized cannabis here in Canada. Uh, so uh, I was in a mushroom store the other day. Like, I mean, we've, you know, there there is, you know, this is kind of, Vancouver's always been the place where, uh, you know, municipalities have been licensing uh, Cannabis stores before it was legalized, mushrooms, you know, uh, psychos, whatever that is, uh, you know, all the all these, uh, you know, harm reduction things kind of come from the street first. The kind of cops catch on, and then legislators are are kind of last to follow. So uh, that that would be the flow of it. But it, it there has been some detrimental side to the debate, as you said, the the kind of you know folks looking for political angles have said oh this is causing all these these problems where there's no research to say that at all and in fact it it's 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 helping save lives so that's the thing to keep hammering away i, I really want to come back to some of those things that you mentioned particularly safe supply um other harm reduction inter interventions overdose prevention centers or safe consumption that you you all have had in vancouver for for a long time um but i also want to go to to neve and talk uh, just continue this thread in terms of what we know about the results of decrim. Um, and, and I think Portugal is the, the most 
uh, studied the most held up example of positive health impacts. I wonder if you could just share that with us real quick, what you know. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and I think, you mean, I think Corey has an impossible task um, in terms of evidencing the effectiveness of a policy within 18 months in the middle of a global pandemic. And, you know, the idea, the attacks on, on Oregon are, are, are totally unreasonable in my view. I mean, it took at least a decade for Portugal to evidence some of the outcomes that it was experiencing. Um, but as I said, you I mean Portugal um, established decriminalization in response to their own uh, drug death crisis, so their drug overdose crisis. And in the first 10 years of the policy, I mean, they were able to evidence that use had fallen amongst vulnerable groups, including use um, amongst um, adolescents. And I think this reflects the research globally of uh, jurisdictions that have ended criminal sanctions. Drug use does not go up. That is established. The law doesn't really impact on people's decision to use drugs. That's not the reason they, they decide to, to, to smoke cannabis or, or, or use heroin. Um, there was a 40% fall in injecting um, and massive increase in treatment numbers as money was transferred from criminal justice responses from policing into health. Again, I think this is an important part of the, the equation. Uh, in terms of drug-related deaths, uh, when Portugal first introduced decriminalization, so ending criminal sanctions for possession, uh, their deaths were 369 in the population. That fell to 72 in 2020. So in Portugal, the drug-related death is 10 per million of the population. And in fact, if we look at all countries across Europe that have decriminalized, so the Netherlands, Spain, Italy, um, uh, Estonia, uh, and Estonia had its own problems with uh, fentanyl. So that's an interesting one to look at. Um, all of those countries have lower rates of drug related deaths, much lower rates compared to the countries that have the highest in Europe, which are UK, Sweden, Norway, all of which take a tough criminal justice response to drug possession and drug supply. So it just shows us that that providing that environment coupled with investment in treatment, it can really have a profound impact. Um, the other thing around, you know, not everybody really cares about the health and well-being of people. I do. That's kind of my big driver. I think that's shared by, by folks on this, this panel and on, on today's um, conference. Uh, but, you know, there are other examples from other countries that have decriminalized around impact on criminal justice involvement or criminal legal system involvement. So Australia, for example, has uh, decriminalized cannabis only. Now, we have seen most recently the Australian Capital Territory will decriminalize all drugs as of next year. But they've done a lot of research into cannabis decriminalization, which started right back in the 80s, 90s. Um, and, and there's one piece that, that I point to quite a lot, which is around the impact of criminalization on people who have, who in one state were criminalized for possession of cannabis against those who had not been criminalized. Um, and for those who had been criminalized, their outcomes were much worse across housing, across family relationships and across employment. And interestingly, they were much more likely to come back into contact with the criminal justice system. And in fact, the comparative cohort that was looked at, 32% of people who were who had been criminalized in the state that continued to use criminal sanctions were back in contact with the system, with police within a year. In the state that didn't, that had decriminalized uh, possession of cannabis, there was zero percent. They didn't come back into contact with, they were never in contact with the criminal justice system. And I don't think that's surprising to anybody. I mean, if we look at gateway effects, actually first contact with the criminal justice system is likely to increase recontact. So it's really important to recognize that we're breaking a chain around um, around that, that risk of recidivism by decriminalization. Uh, and there's economic arguments as well that, that you know, if folks are interested in, they can reach out to me and I'm happy to provide them with the evidence for that. Uh, I, I feel like, you know, I just want to let you speak about this at, at nauseum. I mean, there's there's so much to pack in here and I really appreciate you, you getting into all of that. Um, I wanted to shift just a little bit because I think that uh, 
people think, I think that people think generally that, you know, drugs are illegal, drugs should be illegal, whatever, uh, that, that this is sort of like the general sentiment. Um, and I'm not so sure that's the case. And I think, Kennedy, you you talked a little bit about the police. And I know that in in, in BC and, and Vancouver, you know, there's there's pretty good support for I mean, really strong uh, support from police, from law enforcement. Um, but but even stepping back, when I when I speak with people in Vermont um, and, and really around the U.S. about drug policy, when I have one on one conversations, I really find that a lot of people who are, uh, a lot of people really fundamentally agree that criminalizing people who use drugs just really doesn't make any sense. And, and we did a poll last year in Vermont uh, that, that found that over 80% of Vermonters support ending criminal penalties and shifting to a fully health-based model, health-focused model. Um, do, you, do you all get the sense that there's more consensus on this than, than is, you know, policymakers really acknowledge and that, that is sort of the media really acknowledges. I mean, I, I, get, I get the sense that there's more support for this than, than really comes to the surface sometimes. Um, I think there's actually more support from the policymakers too. They're just scared um, because, you know, the status quo is a really difficult thing to overturn. And uh, having spent 11 years with other politicians, like you don't get to be a hero on too many issues. <laughs> Right. So they have to pick which ones that that they want to basically spend their political capital on. So if you if you talk to them, you know, I've talked to many, many federal ministers about this uh, on both sides, you know, and from different parties. And they'll tell you off the record that, yeah, what we're doing is stupid. The police will tell you that, uh, you know, everybody knows that is. But then the thing is, you have to have really policy champions to jump in and 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 start the ball rolling. So that's exactly what happened in Oregon, right? Uh, you know, various organizations came together and used a legal mechanism to to force this onto the agenda. Um, you know, what happened in Vancouver is uh, is um, it wasn't really on my radar at all. And then we had an activist federal health minister who phoned me up and said, "Hey, do you want to?" <laughs> You know, do you want to decriminalize drugs in the city of Vancouver? Because we found a mechanism for you to do that. And I said, okay, sure, let's go for it. Um, and in fact, the prime minister had told me twice to my face he would never do it. So we had kind of a rebel health minister that used discretion to to do this. And then, you know, still remains in cabinet today. So so uh, she has survived. Different position, though. <laughs> Different portfolio. So, you know, I think, like, what are you in politics for? It's, it's to make change, I guess. Uh, and... And uh, I think you need folks to just to kind of jump up and try this stuff. Uh, you know, we rely on the, the scientists and the social scientists to uh, to give us the evidence. But it, it's just like the the basics of it are so overwhelming that, uh, you know, I, I've lost a family member to, to overdose. I have another family member who, you know, he's quickly sliding into, uh, you know, daily fentanyl destruction and, and you know, arresting this guy is not going to do anything. And everybody knows that everybody does. Uh, and so how do you help is the much bigger challenge. Like, because we know 90% of folks, or at least here, you know, they, they relapse from treatment and the, the treatment models of abstinence don't work, you know, or in, for many, many people. So like the, the people, the answer people grab to is, well, we'll get more treatment beds, but it's like, no, it, that's not going to work either. Uh, and so that's why all the science, like everything comes together, but then you need somebody, you know, the the research, the the basis for policy change all comes together. But you do need somebody to stand up somewhere and say, I'm going to put a bill forward or I'm going to, you know, trigger initiative, which we have here in B.C. And and that's what it what it comes down to, like any change. But you're right, though, that the public all knows that, you know, unless they have some political acts to grind. Uh, but they're they're you know that the opposition side's pretty vicious, right? And as we found, politics has become you know way more toxic too. So so they're just grabbing onto things to to hit with. And I don't think the more progressive drug policy side has found a way to counter that very effectively. Uh, but I think it will change. Well, and I, and I think that really gets the issue that um, has sort of been touched on today, and that is this sort of idea that there is more, you, you talked about the, the political opposition um, has sort of embraced this idea that that the 
visible uh, homelessness, the the visible, um, in some cases, uh, perceived drug use, um, you know, is a result of progressive policies and stuff. Um, it, you know, I think that that's where we, we've seen uh, increased suffering throughout the U.S. and, and really throughout the world. Um, and we've seen sort of that same narrative come up again and again in some of the major cities, um, including here in Vermont, uh, that that somehow that there should be a tougher approach to try and like get people, um, you know, uh, to, to not use uh, substances in a, in a public way. Um, is that an issue that's really <laughs> limited to the U.S. or is that something that you see all over the place? Neve, I guess I'll go to you. Yeah, thanks, Gray. I think that's a really important point to raise. I, mean, I, I live in London. Um, I have read the, the New York Times piece and the, the Post piece on Oregon and Portugal and allegations that Portugal is a, a failed experiment around decriminalization. So I want to pick up on that first and then get into that homelessness piece. So, you know, Portugal is definitely not a failed experiment and the political support in Portugal for decriminalization continues. And that is evidenced by the fact in the last 12 months, they have added fentanyl to the list of substances that are decriminalized and also that they have moved to remove threshold amounts um, because people who were caught above the threshold who were um, simply using um, were being criminalized for the criminal offense of possession above the threshold. So the, so the political establishment in uh, Portugal, the government, the opposition all voted in the majority to remove thresholds and to add fentanyl to the list of drugs. That is a clear sign of support for this policy. So there is no one in Portugal saying this is a failed experiment. Nobody who actually is in charge of policy. Then the issue around homelessness, I mean, there is a drugs crisis. There is no doubt there is a drugs crisis. There is a toxic supply in North America. There now appears to be a toxic supply in Europe. But public use of drugs is a housing crisis. It is not a drugs crisis. And across North America and across Europe, I'm afraid to say, we are seeing increased levels of street homelessness, of rough sleeping, of the unhoused population, because the economic system is broken and people cannot afford basic subsistence. They can't afford housing. They can't afford to eat. This is our problem. And this is where our energy should be focused on is housing solutions, not trying to take away the, the progress that has been made to treat people as human beings and to treat them with dignity and with humanity. And the idea that decriminalization in Oregon has led to the um, street homelessness is, is nonsense. You I mean, I was in LA a couple of weeks ago after the DPA conference and went out and did outreach in South LA. It's heartbreaking to see. I mean, it's absolutely heartbreaking. And we have similar things in London and in Liverpool and in other cities across the UK. It's just not quite as visible as it is in the US. But that is a housing problem. That is not a drug policy problem at the moment. Um, so I, mean, I, I think that's really important. And just to contextualize it, I looked at some of the stats in Europe. Like London, we're up on 21% on street homelessness in the last 12 months. Liverpool, 47% in the last 12 months. Dublin, you know, Ireland is, is also up. Paris is up by 16%. Germany's up by 50%. I mean, this is, this is an issue of, of our economic policies that are failing all of us in society, but particularly those who are most marginalized and most vulnerable. Um, this is not decriminalization, a measure 110 in Oregon. I'll give either of you an opportunity to, to chime in on that as well, if you like, or I can just, uh, uh, we have about 10 more minutes. I wanted to get to one more question, if we have time. I, I would just say, yeah. uh, what came to my mind is the floggings will continue until morale improves is is exactly what this whole approach is, you know, and it's, it's uh, that that's just shocking, but it's happening here in Vancouver too. It's the same, you know, we had a pandemic, right? 
you know, right? People were locked in their houses, like they lost their income, their jobs, you know, huge mental trauma for so many people. And to think that doesn't have any, that's when things start to spike everywhere. And we just kind of ignore it and move on, or most people do. And and uh, that's, it's kind of disgraceful, really, isn't it? And I think like in Europe, we had some of these schemes where we brought people into hotels. I don't know if you Yeah, we did that too. Thing. I was buying and hotels. And put people out again. Like the trauma of that. Can you imagine mm-hmm. to think oh, that yeah. homelessness was solved in some way? We managed to solve it then. But yeah. I mean, wh- what those people went through, it's awful. Mm-hmm. I, I, I want to shift just slightly here, but uh, sort of come back to to what sort of where, where we started in terms of uh, some of the barriers and some of the reasons that that the decriminalization type approaches are are helpful. Um, you know, we've talked a lot. We just watched a video on overdose prevention centers, their efforts in a lot of U.S. states, including here in Vermont, uh, to pass laws that explicitly allow community-based organizations to o- open OPCs or places where, you know, people can can safely use substances that they already possess, that they already intend to use, and where if an overdose happens, there can be an immediate intervention. Um, and there have been places where, like here in Vermont, we passed a, a very comprehensive drug checking bill that provides immunity to people so that they're not going to be, be, be threatened with arrest if they engage in a drug checking service. Cool. Um, we're, we're doing these things to chip away at, at criminalization. I mean, not strategically, these are important things to do. These are our are, are vital life-saving interventions. Um, but the I guess my question is, you know, why not take the next step? Are we, are we, uh, we're, we're creating zones where people aren't going to be criminalized so that we can get them the life-saving services. Um, I don't know what, can, can you all talk about the importance of, of all these types of laws and how they fit into the broader landscape of drug criminalization? I think Kennedy, you had talked about safe supply before, um, all these different types of, of, uh, mechanisms really, uh, reduce criminalization um, in, in, in an effort to get people better services. Does that make sense? Yeah, I guess like in terms of overdose uh, prevention sites, you know, we, I think, started the first one here in North America in 2003. Uh, we haven't had a single death on the premises. I think we have now at least 10 or 12 in the city. Uh, again, without losing a single person, there's many overdoses, you know, but uh, the, the staff on site, I mean, they're kind of a no brainer. The only thing is, is you have to go to where, uh, you know, if you're, if you're a drug user, you have to go to the specific uh, zone in order to use and, and uh, access services. So, you know, they started mobile vans here, but most people are dying in their house by themselves, right? And there's no overdose prevention service in the house. So, that's why decrim is is good because it allows folks to test drugs and access services. Um, you know uh, what I was talking to Dr. Martin Schechter, who's here at University of British Columbia, uh, a couple of days ago. Um, he was saying now most fentanyl use is inhaled. Uh, it, so so these are injection sites. We don't have inhalation sites, and so really we also have to remember that the environment of drug use changes uh, rapidly. Uh, without really, we have no control over that. Whatever is available, fentanyl is being produced locally here now. It's not being imported anymore. Um, and so, you know, the science has to catch up with, uh, well, there is importation, but there's some domestic production. So we we do have to kind of keep on top of this with the research. And the best way to do it is to talk to drug users because they're in it every, every day um, and uh, try to change our services accordingly but like you said it's kind of chipping away at the edge and it's a larger policy change that that's going to uh going to help but uh and then we'll have to have people kind of step up and do that <laughs> so i mean um but i i broadly think the public it, here and across canada start especially when fentanyl hits the community like that just that is wow people are just knocked sideways when that starts to happen so um that that kind of moves the public uh, ground support. Yeah, I think also too, what we end up seeing is that there is an awful lot of a technical dance between law enforcement and these initiatives. 
And these are initiatives are brilliant in their own right. Absolutely. But the problem that you have then is like, what space around the LPC is decriminalized? Like, what, what, how do the police manage? And then the police get very scared about, well, what if it attracts drug dealing? So like, it's all of these t- different mechanisms that are part of the bigger kind of criminal justice prohibitionist framework that then become part of the discussion of just trying to set up a health intervention. So they become part of that health intervention and that negotiation and navigation. So that makes it more difficult and it takes it longer to implement. I think also, even if you have legislated for these interventions, and again, I think everyone should have these interventions, but also anyone accessing them, whether it's an OPC, whether it's a drug checking service, are identifying as a criminal. They may be okay in that space, but as they walk out of that space, they are known to be someone who is breaking the law. They are they are committing a criminal offense and police can see that. And that or their neighbors can see it. Yeah. Or you know their employer can see it. And so it creates the stigma that was so eloquently talked about by Sarah at the start of this whole seminar. Mm -hmm. Um, And it also means that most people or many people will not access these services. And and, then just to give you one example from the UK, where we still continue to criminalize folks. But in the UK, we have our own drug related deaths crisis. It's the highest on record uh, since records began in the 1990s. And 50% of people who are dying have not been in contact with treatment services. Remembering treatment services here are free and accessible, Mm -hmm. have not been in contact with treatment services for at least five years. And that is because many reasons, but one of them is because they are seen as a criminal first and foremost. Mm -hmm. And if we look at countries like Spain, that never criminal, well, Spain, there was an attempt to criminalize back in the 1980s, but the constitutional court said no. And in Spain, it's actually lawful to possess and socially supply any controlled substance. And in Spain, they can do decriminalization. They can do drug checking without any need for legislation or police involvement. So it creates this environment that maximizes health interventions. It doesn't, you know, the environment that we work in at the minute actually not only minimizes health, it's like a health negative, if you like. I don't know a better way of explaining that, but it is a health negative. It's contributing to negative outcomes around around what we're trying to achieve with these interventions. So I think decriminalization acts as an enabler for people to to access these services in a way that isn't possible while we continue to criminalize folks. Yeah, so, so really quick, I think that, that context is really important, right? I mean, you know, we've had the modern war on drugs in the United States for about 50 years. So, you know, people in, in my generation and generation before, you know, grew up with it. That is the water in which we swim. We see it as normal, as, you know, it's become normalized. So I think it's, I think we should do a better job of letting people know this is actually extremely yeah. abnormal. Um, you know, the United States arrests, um, you know, and incarcerates an extraordinarily high number of people, many of them, you know, for nonviolent drug crimes. And yeah, I mean, I think that, like, that's the question, like, what are we trying to do here, right? And all of these things, which, as you say, are great, they're positive changes, they're moves in the right direction, but they exist in this um, understanding, you know, the shared understanding, which as, as Greg was saying, the polls actually show the majority of Americans, depending on how you ask the question, actually say that they don't support the continued criminalization of possession and, and use of, of controlled substances. Um, you know, but the, the entire system is still set up that way. It is, you know, drugs are bad, people who use the wrong drugs are bad, and they should be punished, they should be stigmatized, you know, um, and that's why we get these, you know, little carve outs like, oh, like, you know, you can test your drugs. Um, you know, you can you can come this one little spot, you know, and you can use your drugs there. You know, it, 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 it's, it's absurd. Right. And that's because we have not made that shift to decide, you know, as a whatever group. Um, and I think that the experience of Vancouver is really instructive and in say, like, you know, it doesn't need to be a national um, necessarily. Mm-hmm. You know, like there is um, there is some ability at the at the state level and at the local level to say, like, no, like we actually, you know, want to direct our, um, you know, our, our, our efforts towards doing 
everything that we can to make sure that people who are using drugs and everybody else in the community is safe, right? So how do we design our systems to do that? And that's just, we, you know, we just haven't made that decision, right? We were still saying, you know, like, well, we, we think these are bad people and, you know, we're willing to like make some concessions. Okay. Like, you know, on, you know, okay. Public health people, like we get what you're saying, like, okay, fine. Have some like, needle exchange programs over on that side of town. We're not going to fund them, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, I, I think that that is like the next step is, you know, um, really showing people that that is, that is an absurd situation. Um, and, you know, and we really need to, to shift that, you know, to saying like, okay, like what does an actual health forward, equity forward, justice forward, human forward policy look like and, you know, direct our efforts in, um, in that way. Talking, you know, preaching to the choir, I know, but, I, but I, I do think it's important to kind of verbalize what I think that we're all kind of trying to say. <laughs> Kennedy, any last minute thoughts? As we I would say up? just step up and do something, you know, get out of your comfort zone. Uh, we have mountains of studies, which are good, but but really just just take some risks here. The folks are dying and, and uh, it, it's a torturous death. Like this is not like overdosing four or five, six, 10 times being revived by naloxone, suffering brain damage. You know, these are our neighbors, right? This isn't, these aren't some foreign people, you know, somebody we don't know, they're not aliens. They're, they're our next door neighbors. So like, just, just step up and do something and take the risk. Neve, any last minute thoughts? So I just to, to reflect on some of the comments that have been made throughout today. You mean drug use is ubiquitous in society. It is across all social and economic classes. For a large proportion of society, it's already decriminalized because they are protected by their their class and their ethnicity. Criminalization of drugs is actually focused on communities living in poverty and black and brown communities. You mean. When we talk about decriminalization, we're only talking about relieving. We're talking about equity in the law for all. That's what we're talking about. Well, I I, I think we'll wrap up there. Um, and that, that really gets us to the point of wrapping up the entire event. But I, I want to say thank you to the three of you so much. Uh, I, I know this is... Uh, coming in the middle of busy, busy times for all of you. And uh, it's really nice of you to spend so much time with us today. And I know some of you spent even more time earlier in the day watching some of the presentations. Um, so thanks again for being here and for all the work that you're doing all over the place. Um, this is really terrific. Uh, 